Gentlemen, could I ask you to please take your seats? We're going to start momentarily. Mesdames et Messieurs, asseyez-vous s'il vous plaît. On va commencer très bientôt. Thank you. <laughs> Whoa. Oh, <please. laughs> Here, do you want to hear that? We're Test on. two, three. Yes. You got it? <laughs> okay, thanks. <laughs> well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Bonjour et bienvenue à toutes et à tous. My name is David Mitchell. I'm president and CEO of Canada's Public Policy Forum, and I welcome you here today, this morning, at the Canadian Museum of Nature, on the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin people, to this important dialogue, forestry, future, sustainable solutions. You'll notice the hashtag up here, future of forestry. And uh, that's for anyone tweeting, and there are people in the room who I know who are doing that. And uh, we're connected not only with uh, this audience here this morning, very diverse group of people from different parts of our country, but also through a live uh, webcast, uh, we're joined by uh, many, many more Canadians right across the country, and in fact, from the United States as well. So I welcome you all to this dialogue today and invite you to engage actively in the conversation. Let me, um, let me tell you that for me this is actually a very special event because uh, earlier in my career I worked in the forest industry in British Columbia. And uh, those were days that uh, were very challenging, very challenging times. Uh, the war in the woods, is what uh, was often referred to in British Columbia. M many of you in the room will know what I'm referring to. Uh, the challenges between communities, the industry, First Nations, environmental activists, governments at all levels, the war in the woods. Um, and there was a lot of talk about sustainability. Boy, we made some progress since those days. I'm very proud of that. But we still have so much more to do. Uh, a little later in my career, when I was a member of the British Columbia Legislature, I was invited to a very interesting dialogue involving those various stakeholders I just referred to. And we were trying to understand how to develop some trust among some, some groups that were not getting along very well together in the so-called War in the Woods. This was in the 1990s. And, um, I, I attended a very interesting dialogue, and it was my first experience with the Public Policy Forum. That was my introduction to the work that the forum does in trying to build bridges across sectors. And uh, it was a healthy discussion, but as I said, uh, we've come a long way since those days, and, um, and yes, there is a lot more to be done. The Public Policy Forum is a non-governmental organization based here in Ottawa, but we work right across the country. We're made up of members, um, including member organizations well represented here in this room today. And we seek to build bridges between governments, industry, civil society. And uh, very much in the spirit of today's session, we're hoping to build uh, as well some common understanding, some respect, and some trust as we move forward towards sustainable solutions in the future. Um, our identity as Canadians has really been shaped by green spaces and forests. Our identity and many of our fondest memories are really derived from this. And the forest industry, while it's made great strides in retooling and repositioning itself as a green and renewable industry, um, still has challenges in terms of communication, public engagement, and building trust. We've convened you here today to share successes, 
discuss knowledge gaps where they exist and persist, and explore strategies for advancing the forest sector in Canada. This morning will feature two panel discussions, um, and we're going to be looking at perspectives from um, a number of different uh, contexts, and uh, both national, regional, and international, looking at uh, perspectives from science, from government, and from the academy. And I encourage you to participate in the discussion as well as those who are uh, participating online right now. Over lunch, we're going to be joined, I'm very pleased to say, uh, by Ann Giardini, the former president of Weyerhaeuser uh, and uh, the current chancellor of Simon Fraser University. And she will be here in this room uh, where we're physically assembled this morning offering uh, some keynote remarks on the theme of this gathering. So uh, that gives you a sense of what uh, we have in store for you in terms of the remainder of this morning and early afternoon. And it's now my great pleasure to uh, introduce you to the first panel, or at least to the moderator of the panel who will introduce the panelists. And I'm referring to David Lindsay, who is the president of the Forest Products Association of Canada. Uh, David is someone who's well known to most of you who are here with us today. Uh, he's a real leader in the natural resource sector, having served as a, a deputy minister in the Ontario Public Service in a number of key portfolios. Um, we're delighted that he's here with us today. David's experience includes serving on a number of boards, private sector and voluntary sector boards. Uh, I'm pleased to say he's a former board member of the Public Policy Forum. And uh, we thank him for his work in laying the foundation for what we're aspiring to do today. So, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming David Lindsay. Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, David. Uh, and, and thank you and the Public Policy Forum and your organization <coughs> and all your team for, for the incredible work they've done to help put this together today. Uh, the background uh, uh, discussion guide, uh, the webcast, uh, it's really coming together quite nicely. So we thank you and look forward to a, a great discussion. You've brought together some terrific panelists and, and I see uh, Anne's just joined us. Uh, look forward to her luncheon address as well. The, uh, uh, it's good to be here in the Museum of Nature talking about forestry. It's only appropriate that we're here in the Museum of Nature and I want to thank uh, Meg Bechtel and her team for good work they do here as well. Uh, we've got a uh, number of people on joining us via webcast, as David mentioned, so there's a, a few logistics things we should take care of uh, before I introduce the panel members. Uh, if you are going to make an intervention or want to make a comment or participate in the dialogue, uh, we encourage you to please come up to the microphones uh, so that people on the web can hear us. And we also have staff at the back of the room who are monitoring the activity on the web so that they can take questions from those of you participating in the webcast and they will uh, read your questions out as though you were in the room. Uh, unfortunately, we can't see you. Uh, so when you do submit your question, we encourage you to tell us who you are and where you're coming from and uh, the organization you represent. Uh, likewise, the people in the room, so we all know uh, each other uh, a bit better towards the end of the day. Please introduce yourself when you speak to the microphone or when you make your uh, questions uh, on the webcast. Uh, we want to explore uh, an, a number of issues uh, throughout the morning, and we've got uh, two great panels with uh, wonderful participants. Uh, and, and I just wrote down some of the words that uh, uh, David mentioned in his uh, terrific introduction, respect trust and common understanding. Uh, that's certainly uh, what I hope uh, that we can get out of uh, this day's session and continue to build the dialogue and the relationships with our colleagues and partners uh, both here in the room and, uh, and across the country. Uh, the, the first panel this morning, uh, we have uh, circulated biographies uh, in your packages and they're available on, on the uh, discussion dialogue. So I'm not going to read them to you, but uh, I certainly do want to formally introduce you to uh, our three expert panelists here this morning. The uh, uh, gentleman to my immediate right is uh, uh, Pierre Bernard. He's a research. Uh, pardon me, Bernier. Uh, Pierre Bernier is a research scientist and, uh, and uh, 
on forest productivity and climate change. And uh, uh, Dr. Bernier works with the Canadian Forest Service. But if you read through his biography, you will also see uh, an incredible academic background and uh, academic engagement as well. He has his PhD from the University of Georgia. And uh, in addition to his other academic duties at a number of universities, he is also the editor-in-chief of the Canadian Journal of Forest Research. So we're, we're pleased to have uh, Pierre with us this morning. Uh, to my far left, uh, Andre Morisot is uh, also very experienced in uh, Aboriginal issues. He's the director of awards and communications for the Canadian Council of Aboriginal Business. And Andre is, uh, we were chatting this morning, a uh, member of uh, Fort William's First Nation in Northern Ontario. Uh, been to uh, Fort William a number of times. Uh, uh, a great uh, business is happening uh, with forestry and uh, for First Nations at Fort William. Uh, he has a wealth of experience on uh, First Nations issues. Uh, if you read through his biography, you'll see a particular focus on uh, Aboriginal arts and culture. And uh, among his honors, uh, he was one of the first recipients of the Toronto Aboriginal Affairs Award. So it's great that he's with us here in Ottawa this morning. Uh, last but certainly not least, uh, a colleague uh, who I've come to know over the past couple of years is uh, Dr. Winnett Smith. Uh, Winnett is the executive director of Global Forest Watch here in Canada. Uh, you'll see from uh, Dr. Smith's biography that uh, she has her PhD from the University of Cambridge. And among her many accomplishments, she spent time working at the United Nations from 2007 to 2012 as a coordinator and natural resources expert. Uh, but uh, uh, it's wonderfully uh, positioned on her uh, biography. She says her uh, uh, passion and her interest in nature may have taken her around the world, but she's always pleased that she's drawn back to Canada. So it's great that you're with us as well, Winnet. Uh, at, at the uh, suggestion and advice of uh, the Public Policy Forum who do these things as a matter of their core business, uh, facilitating roundtable dialogue. If you uh, look at their logo, it's a, uh, a table, a circular table, encouraging people to talk and engage. Uh, they encouraged us not to do PowerPoint presentations and have uh, formal uh, uh, stand-up uh, uh, presentations at this session, but instead engage in more of a dialogue. And uh, uh, we uh, had a chance to chat, each of us, briefly uh, uh, before we came here this morning. So uh, hopefully this will be uh, an entertaining and engaging dialogue for, um, we'll try and do it for about uh, 40, 45, maybe 50 minutes, because we've got, uh, uh, I look around the room, a lot of knowledgeable and, and experienced people here. And uh, I know we've got, uh, uh, over 130, 140 participants uh, logged on to the website. We want to make sure you have an opportunity to engage as well. So we'll leave lots of time for discussion and gut dialogue. Uh, so to, to kick things off, uh, we want to talk about uh, uh, managing our forests, uh, being open and transparent about how we manage uh, a sustainably uh, managed forest, respecting uh, both social, economic, and environmental considerations. So to do that, you need to begin with some data or data. Uh, so I'm going to ask uh, maybe Pierre uh, on my right to kick us off with uh, just a general introduction for non-foresters like me and non-scientists. Just where does the data come from uh, and, and how, do we, uh, how do we gather that information from such a huge geographical landscape like Canada's forests? And then uh, I may ask Winnet to, to, to jump in and, and help talk about then how we analyze and how we use that data. But first, let's start with the data. Thank Pierre. you. Thank you, David, for that good introduction. And thank you also for Public Policy Forum for having us here. Very interesting, uh, potentially interesting panel. So data, data is kind of a center to, to the uh, business of forestry. I'm a forester by training. Did my master's in forestry at Laval University. And one thing, the first thing you learn when you do forestry is that you need field data. And so forestry is an interesting discipline because it's multi-scale. But at the bottom of the scale are, are the stands and the clumps of trees that you're really managing and, and trying to uh, basically extract value from or manage for wildlife or whatever. So, so the most fundamental and precious information is from people going in the field and measuring trees and, and digging holes in the ground, taking soil samples, uh, measuring dead woody debris on the ground. Uh, all these very, very time consuming and very expensive uh, activities because you have to send people in remote areas 
um, and either for operational forestry or for research. Th those field data are, are really precious. In operational forestry, you have the, what we call the permanent sample plots. So plots that are set up in the ground, uh, on the ground <coughs> in, in the forest. Uh, our regular size is 400 square meters. That's kind of, a, as foresters, that, that, that number is kind of ingrained in your mind. Uh, but those plots, let's say, are measured every 10 years. Uh, you know, technicians will go back every 10 years, we measure the same trees, we measure the dead trees, the live trees, look at, at the processes involved in, as those stands evolve. So these data are really, really fundamental because they underpin everything else we do on the landscape. So I guess that's at the, the basic stand level information. But then you have data that comes in at another level because we manage landscapes as foresters. Uh, so uh, you have to have landscape level information. So you have to see what your landscape looks like. So you have traditionally photo interpretation. So people that sit down and, and draw uh, what we call polygons technically. So draw basically circles or, or, or shapes around stands that look alike and, and interpret the properties that they see, the height, the density, the species. And then uh, across, across all, like in, I'm from the province of Quebec, this is done every 10 years across the full province, usually. Uh, but other provincial jurisdictions do the same thing with their, with their, their, their crews and their photo interpreters. And they link their, their field plot information to those mapped information to produce a, a coherent picture of the, uh, of, of the forest landscapes. And now we have other data that comes in. We have the satellite data that are coming in, the new technologies, the LIDAR, so laser-based measurement of, of high, tree height from airplanes. So all these new technologies are pouring in, creating data sets of size that are almost unimaginable uh, to process. So really, really a, a new level of information coming in very rapidly, like the, the streaming of that in terms of technology progress is, is amazing. But nevertheless, with all those fancy technologies, you always have to go back to the little guy on the ground with the writing, with the pen and the paper that is taking notes about trees because it's a scaling up exercise. Forestry is, is all about scales and it's all about scaling up. So you know th that hierarchy of, of data sources is very important, but we must never forget that at the very bottom are the, all those field data, the holes in the ground and the trees that are measured in diameters and height and species. So I'm fascinating and I get the concept of lots of information coming in from lots of different levels. Um, I'm not a forester, I'm not a scientist, but I'm an accountant. <laughs> <laughs> Who pays for it? Well, uh, in Canada, most of the forest is public, so it's the public that pays for it. So forest agencies, like in most jurisdictions, on some I, I can talk from, from my end of the country where it's done by the public sector, so it's done by the province that pays for a forest inventory. I know in other places uh, where forest companies manage landscapes, they, are, they might be given the, the duty to do inventory on their landscape. They've got the mandate. The mandate right, to right, do it. Right. So by and large, although across Canada, in most parts, it's a public domain uh, activity. Great, great. So the data, the data is public, and it's not proprietary data, which is good. So data is uh, a raw material that begins the conversation. When at your organization is quite active in, in monitoring and analyzing forests, so why don't you tell us a little bit about what kind of data you guys use? Okay, well, first let me also say thank you to the Public Policy Forum for this invitation, and to, I'm happy to be here and be part of this discussion, um, because I believe that open data, available, publicly available data, is crucial to managing our forest landscapes. Uh, in Canada and in, in other jurisdictions. Um, Pierre gave a very good overview of types of data that are available. Um, and I, one of the things I just want to underline, I think before I talk about analyzing it, is how much progress there has been in the last couple of decades on the amount of data available. It really is astounding the, the progress in terms of uh, remote sensing data from satellite images that are now available and publicly available. Uh, it's become cheaper to do work uh, in, in this area. Um, it poses challenges in terms of um, conveying information, which I'm sure we'll come back to. But there's also been huge increases in the computational ability to actually process data. And also as internet speeds have gotten better, the ability of folks around the world to access data has, has improved, um, has changed dramatically. So it changes the conversation. 
Yeah. Global Forest Watch Canada has, uh, is celebrating its 15th year uh, in 2015, uh, celebrating 15 years of trying to inform a greener future. And our focus as an organization is to help collect and analyze information on the state, uh, the extent and state of Canada's forests, at, mostly at a national level, though we also do regional work. But we rely on products from the government. Um, so we, over the years, have used many government data sets. But we've also compiled a number of data sets. As everyone in this room will know, I'm sure, that, uh, and hope out there on the, the web, that since forests in Canada are basically managed at a provincial level, many data sets are available provincially. And one of the things that Global Forest Watch Canada has focused on from the beginning has been compiling national data sets of um, infrastructure, of development activities. And I'm talking about more than just the forestry sector, because forest landscapes are impacted by more than just the forestry sector. And so we've compiled and maintained a number of data sets on roads, mines, dams, um, well sites, mining leases, et cetera, to try and look at what's, what's happening on, on the forest. And, and uh, those are in demand by many organizations, including people in academia, including by the government. Uh, and we are actually updating data sets as we speak uh, because people want those uh, for ongoing analysis. So we create some, but we also use then uh, satellite imagery that's been, we have created our own data sets. One is uh, called intact forest landscapes, which, is, which are large areas of non-disturbed forests. By non-disturbed, I mean anthropogenically undisturbed. Uh, we can come back to the difference between some global data sets and Canadian specific data sets, because there's always challenges around definitions and what's included. Uh, how you, I mean, scientists um, need to define things and then be very clear about what they're analyzing, what their pro products are uh, conveying as in terms of the results. And that, that's another challenge, is making sure that that's clear to the public, to the general public that might be using information. You've, you've raised lots of points. Yeah, sorry, so, I'm so, probably so, covering so we're, we're, way we're, too we're, much. We're, we're, we've, we've, we've got 40 minutes, so we'll get through it all, uh, <laughs> hopefully. And what we don't get through, we're going to encourage the audience and, and those on the uh, webcast to uh, uh, ask questions about. But I, I, I do have to stop you right, right here because I've got to ask David Mitchell, who's been running uh, public policy forum events for a number of years. I think that's got to be a record. We were eight minutes into it when Section 91 and Section 92 of the Constitution was raised, and we started talking about whether it's a federal or provincial responsibility. So that's, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. Um, uh, when at, you, 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 let's do the, because of your international experience, I, 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 maybe I'll start there. Tell me a bit more about Canada's data, uh, the robustness or lack of robustness of Canada's data relative to other countries. T tell us a bit about you started to go down that path. I'll encourage you to, to, to amplify that a little bit more. Um, well, yeah, I'm, I know I covered a lot of ground, but I'm, I like to think about inter things in an integrated way. And so to me, uh, issues lead to one another, and it's hard to, to segment out things. But uh, in terms of Canadian data, uh, I think that um, there's, compared to many other countries, there is a lot of very good data that's created. Uh, by both provincial and federal t um, jurisdictions, agencies. Uh, Pierre and his colleagues have done some amazing work with remote sensing data trying to do change detection and looking at actual um, reasons for change on the ground when there's change in forest cover, so say. Uh, and you can compare those to uh, international data sets. For example, uh, Matt Hansen and colleagues out of University of Maryland have created a global data set from Landsat imagery of tree loss and gain. Um, there's challenges with that data set in terms of it can identify plantation forests as, uh, as trees, so uh, it might not pick up on changes. So there's, um, there's good data, but uh, I think most scientists would probably agree you can always get better data. And uh, part of it is what is it really telling you and how do you combine it with other data sets to do analysis. So um, I don't think any one jurisdiction has uh, the final word on, on eco ecological condition. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. But Canadian 
data is much better than in many tropical developing countries that I've worked in. Um, but public, the public in Canada demands, wants to know what's going on, has yeah. concerns about how our forests are being managed, uh, and has a range of, have a range of values that they care about in relation to that forest. So we need a range of uh, data sets Very much so. that aren't always yeah. easily accessible or available, even in Canada. And, and you mentioned uh, the range of val uh, the, the different variety of values we place on the landscape and our, our resources. Pierre's talked about uh, the layers of, of data input. We, we haven't had a chance to let uh, Andre join in on the conversation. And one of the important values uh, we place is, is the social engagement and making sure uh, Indigenous people, our First Nations, are uh, respected and we make sure they're uh, taking all the opportunities they can uh, both to exercise their traditional rights but also to engage in the economic opportunities and enjoy the the uh, sustainable forest for seven generations as is the tradition uh, so Andre tell us a little bit about uh, how we can make sure uh, industry and government and First Nations could be working together on on managing a sustainable forest in Canada well, I just want to start by saying thank you very much to uh, David and uh, to the forum because I think that this really represents, uh, it's, it's a bit of a paradigm shift. I'm very honored and I'm sure that um, all Aboriginal Canadians are very honored to be on this panel this morning. It's something, it's something new, it's something different, I think. Maybe I'm wrong, but I think it's really exciting and wonderful. And uh, that said, you know, I. I have to say that I am fascinated with the information that I'm listening to here because I am not a forester. The closest I come to forest is the beautiful park that I've lived across the street from in Toronto for 30 years. And I mean that, I mean that's the, you know, but I do have a home on my First Nation and my father, as it turns out, started his career in forestry as a scaler and went on to become one of the first um, uh, Aboriginal game wardens on Lake of the Woods. He was a conservation officer, worked for the lands and forests. So Smokey the Bear and forests have meant a lot to me all my life. <laughs> but that said, I think that this world of information we're talking about, that now it's time for us to change the way we share that information. And uh, speaking on behalf of the Canadian Council for Aboriginal Business, I see so much optimism and a tool that we are using is our progressive Aboriginal relations program that we have that I'm hoping we can get more into I I, I don't want to go into detail because I think that we're going to have time to discuss that this is uh, what it is but there is so much room there for our forestries and our First Nations Aboriginal peoples across the country to come together to build that business certainty and to create that sustainability that I think is what everyone in the room and in the country really wants. Good. So, so the uh, Aboriginal engagement document that you just waved there a minute ago, I, I know it's available on your website. You're encouraging companies, and we're using it uh, at our organization. D give me a few more examples of what it means. What, what, what kind of engagement tools do you recommend well, companies and, and people use with First Nations communities? Well, if I may. I don't wish to be dry, I just wish to be correct. The PAR program provides a framework for companies to measure and manage their approach to Aboriginal relations. It's an online management and reporting program that supports progressive improvement in Aboriginal relations management within a company. It focuses on four key performance areas, Aboriginal employment, business development, community investment, and community engagement. Its management system approach is fit for purpose, meaning it's flexible, um, and can be applied to companies in a range of industries that are a range of sizes. PAR members include large natural resource industry, banks, crown corporations, support services such as Be Clean and Sodexo, different sectors, energy, BC Hydro, Suncor, Sask Power, support services, Be Clean, ATCO, ESS, Aramark, Natural Resources, IT, IBM, Banking, TD, Scotia, BMO, Professional Services, Gowlings, Higgins, Construction and Engineering, O'Connell, Hatch, Architecture and Landscape Design, Brooke, Brooke McElroy. Um, PAR is a management tool 
that includes a strategic framework involving vision, principles, policy strategies, goals, targets, and action plans. PAR was enhanced in 2011 to reflect best practices in Global Reporting Initiative, an internationally recognized reporting standard, and also demonstrates alignment to forestry-related certifications programs, such as the Sustainable Forestry Initiative, SFI certification. All that said, I think that one of the challenges that we have uh, with our PAR program is that many of the forestry industries because they vary in size, and they're not like these huge, huge corporations, many of them are smaller businesses, that they seem to see PAR as not being their fit. But we see that as being quite the opposite. Our program is here to help you understand how to work with our First Nations. It's as simple as that. And it's a great program, and uh, we're reaping great benefits on both sides of the table. Thank you, Andre. So we've got the three legs of the stool. We've got to think about our social engagement. We've got to think about our environmental values, and we've got to think about the economic opportunities and bring all of those things together. It seems to me that uh, depending on uh, uh, where you uh, sit in this conversation is where you stand on the issues. Uh, the industry will have a particular focus. First Nations have a focus. Environmental groups have a focus. Government have a focus but it's in the, in the round table dialogue that it really happens. And sometimes it's uh, uh, different interpretations need to be uh, contrasted and compared. Can, when it, you were starting to talk about uh, how, how different organizations analyze data and you were talking about, uh, uh, Pierre, how we bring the data together. Andre, you were talking about how we're in, in giving an Aboriginal opportunity. Where's the, a good example of how to make that happen? Has, has somebody got an example of, of the process that makes that happen? Have we evolved in, in our processes sufficiently to make sure we're balancing all those three legs of the stool? <laughs> uh, difficult question. Uh, I can talk for, from the, uh, I guess from the, uh, certainly the, the technical viewpoint and the public policy viewpoint. And, and I think that's a very important dialogue that we have to have in terms of, of data and, and science informing public policy. And it's not, not only for the biophysical, but also for the social and the, uh, and the uh, uh, public uh, safety and health issues and all the issues relating to the forest. So, uh, you know, for example, we're heavily involved in things related to climate change. And I think climate change is a big, both economically important and, and socially important uh, concern. And I think that's a, a field where, where, where data can really be, and science can be really important in informing policy, informing businesses, and informing communities like First Nations in terms of, of future outlook uh, and needs for adaptation, for example. And, and forestry is a you know, forest reactive climate, basically. And forest environment is very reactive climate. So, so having uh, data and science inform these, all these areas, I think, is, is an area that we're we can really, I guess, uh, work together to make sure that the future is, is better than, than, than if we don't act. So cl climate change is one of the big challenges. Yes. Uh, yes. Let's, let's enumerate a couple of others. What, what other challenges have we got in making sure we've got a sustainably managed forest? Well, I mean, climate change would have been uh, one of the ones I would have uh, highlighted too. But I think just in terms of uh, Canadians managing our our wealth as a whole. So ensuring that we look at our, uh, not just our produced capital, but our natural capital, our human capital, and our social capital. And how do you, say, look at a forest and see all of those components and try and analyze it? Um, it's a challenge, but it's, I think, where we kind of need to go. And there's a real opportunity to do it in a, uh, a collective way and to have dialogue about it to, to we need to to move forward um, I mean if you if you want to talk about initiative I spent the last two years um, being the director of integrated planning for the Canadian boreal forest agreement which is has parties that have been you know in the past or sitting down and trying to use science um, and technical information as well as other social and economic values to identify, come up with joint recommendations, working with government, working with First Nations in mm -hmm. specific territories. That to me is one of the examples of, 
how do you try and do things in a different way, in, in a more collaborative way? Um, and it's not always easy, but you need the information, but you also need to be able to sit at the table and Great. share it and have some sometimes hard discussions about the different perspectives, the different values that people attach to the same pieces of nature, for example. Right. And I, I know the next panel is going to talk about that process and how that works. Um, David, so, if I may? Go ahead. Uh, you know, one aspect of the environmental equation really is about communicating through the use of uh, traditional knowledge and traditional knowledge keepers. So I really see this as being somewhat of, once again, you know, talking about that social change. Because the past has knowledge locked into it. The, the culture has knowledge locked into it. So, you know, once again, through our Progressive Aboriginal Relations Program, we are working towards helping to unlock that knowledge and doing it in a respectful and, uh, you know, a, a new working relationship. So I see that as really being important. So we've got ATK, Aboriginal Traditional Knowledge. We've got LIDAR. We've got 400 meter plots. We've got satellite <laughs> data. There's a plethora of information available. Uh, we're going to have to have a conversation about who's analyzing and how different uh, organizations analyze the data. The, uh, uh, I had a sore elbow a couple of years ago, and so I Googled it and I uh, figured out what it was. I went and saw my doctor and I said, uh, doctor, I think I've got tennis elbow. And he says, no, no, you've got it wrong. You give me the symptoms, I tell you what it is. <laughs> Dr. Google and I have an agreement. I get to be a low hip, he doesn't. <laughs> so gathering the data is the first step, but then analyzing the data. And Aboriginal traditional knowledge is sometimes different from what the 400 uh, square, meter. square meter plots are telling us, which is different from what the satellite technology is telling us. How do we square those circles? Um, well, as I mentioned earlier, I think one of the things is being clear about the data that's being used. So when a, when a researcher, or a, um, a, whether in government or academia or in a civil society organization like, like mine, so you have to be clear on what your data sources are, what your methods are, uh, the, the, so the limitations, uh, the, the caveats on using that information. Uh, now we have technology that allows us to combine a lot more information easily, so geographic information systems where you can take multiple levels of information mm -hmm. and analyze it. Uh, you can model things um, to, to say, well, what are the different parameters and explore what, it, what those layers mean. Um, depending on how you set parameters, you can end up with different uh, results, but it's, it's having that discussion and being able to bring in the different layers. Right. It is, I think, uh, facilitate it by the, the advent of new technology that's easier to use um, and we can do a lot more than we used to. So yes, all this data is a challenge, but it's also an opportunity to try and do things better, use it for better public decision making about our, our, land, you know, our landscapes in Canada and ensuring that we're inclusive in bringing people to the table to have discussions about those, that it's not done behind closed doors, that it's clear to people how you do that. And yeah, and, and people are going to have differences of opinion, but mm -hmm. so then you have to be able to say, these are, this is what we're, the value we're looking at here, and what does it, uh, how we're analyzing it, what does it mean, how does, how does um, Pierre's group's um, remote sensing data on forest change compare to Matt Hansen's data, you know, and this is why. Uh, how does the global intact forest landscape layer differ from ours and, and why. And, and explain that and say then, okay, and this is how you might want to use it. Right, right. So uh, the science of forest management has come a long way. It's not just the data, no, no, no. But, but how we interpret the data and how we use it. In, in your career, Pierre, I'm sure you've seen the, the evolution of how we manage our forests. Can you speak to that a little bit? We've gone from, there's lots of data, now there's lots of ways of interpreting it. Give us a forester's perspective on this. Well, uh, first of all, I'd like to make a point about the distinction between data and information. I think uh, that's very important because we have a lot of data, but in order to turn that data into information, you have to have intelligence. So, so you can look at, at, at a landscape and you have data on that landscape. And, and whether you're, uh, you have data on Aboriginal use of, of the landscape or whether you have data on, on the uh, disturbance regime, you can interpret your data in, in very different ways and, and, and draw from it information that is very different. So, so data, 
is really uh, just like a Swiss Army knife, you know, it's just something that you can it's use. A tool. Mm -hmm. It's a tool, really, to go to, to an intelligence, to, to inference. And so, that's, so a lot of the things we have on, on the web right now are, are data that uh, then you have to pass through your filter to, to be able to draw intelligence out of that. And, and, that's, and then it's in the scientist's or the interpreter's eyesight it's as to how that is transformed. And, and so the, inter the interpretation that's done by somebody may be different than what's done by somebody mm -hmm. else, depending on their own worldview or their, or, or their other source of information. So I think that has to be very clear. Um, but in terms of, uh, of management of forestry, of course, you know, we've, we've gone a long way from when I did my forestry school, we were, you know, the paradigm was sustainable yield. Of you had to have a certain amount of wood coming out of the forest every year, basically, to sustain the companies. And, but but we've, we've gone, and these were provincially mandated type of from frameworks. But we've gone a long way since then, uh, through now uh, sustainable, sustainable management, and even into other, even more, I would say, uh, ecosystem-based management types. Now, of course, those changes are, are slow, because they are, you know, the science is, is in front always, uh, kind of pulling uh, management uh, in front, because science is always looking, looking ahead, you'd hope. Uh, and also the change in the regulatory and legal frameworks at e in each province is something that you can't do overnight. It, it mm -hmm. takes, once you have a system in place, it'll take years to evaluate how it works, uh, and suddenly the shortcomings will be more apparent, and the societal conditions are changing, and within, in about a decade or two, you'll end up with another system that tends to be better than the other, trying to you know, basically plug the holes and, and be more attuned to the new worldviews of society and the new needs. So, so I, I think uh, the, you know, the provincial jurisdictions uh, that, that do really frame forestry uh, through their legislations and, and uh, regulations are, are science informed and the science has progressed and they have progressed also with the science, always lagging behind because they, they, you know, there, there's a lag, but uh, uh, things have changed quite a bit and the, when you talk to foresters, uh, even you know, industrial foresters, you, you, you sense the preoccupation is very different in terms of, of their uh, preoccupation of what's going in the landscape. Mm -hmm. and, and nothing is perfect. You know, people realize that forestry, you go in the forest, you cut trees, it doesn't look good, you know, and, and you're, you're going into an ecosystem and, and you're, you know, you're impacting the ecosystem. But it's, it's like we've done in a place like Ottawa, for example. You know, 200 years ago, this was forest. And, but we've cut it down and we've established a city. And so that was an impact that we agreed that is useful. Uh, you know, in, in forestry, we're one of the few, I think we're the only country in the world, really, that has the challenge of managing uh, a, a really immense natural forest uh, uh, sustainably. Uh, if you look at uh, the only comparative uh, area is, of course, Russia that has a boreal forest also mm -hmm. with all the challenges. and so. Uh, you know, Canada has, is like a one immense experiment. We have uh, very complicated ecosystems with fires and insects uh, that really are, uh, you know, are happening at random, not randomly, but really unmanageably almost, uh, very difficult. Uh, and so the science is trying to come to grips constantly with how to manage this appropriately. Uh, and we've had really a short history of that. Uh, all things being said, a few decades really mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, of, of science-based management, you know, 50, 60 years, 70 years at most, which is short compared to, you know, Germany that's been doing, you know, forced years for hundreds of years. So, so and, and so it's, it's that uh, very delicate balance between economics, mm -hmm. it has to be economical because, you know, companies are there to make a profit. If they don't, they, they won't be there anymore. So it's very important. Uh, but also forests are mostly public. So there is there is uh, uh, really expectations on the public. Public good, here. yeah. Uh, and, and so there are all those competing interests. So the science has to come to grips with how to reconcile that and move force before. And so that has been happening basically over the past few decades on a continuous basis. And it's not just trees. There's people oh, that live no, in the forest oh, exactly. and there's critters that live in the forest. So uh, we should talk if about I may, some of those uh, other values as well. Um, you know, um, I don't speak on behalf of all First Nations in the country. I'm up here speaking on behalf of the Canadian Council of Aboriginal Business and our, our focus, our goal, our vision is to be that bridge between uh, Aboriginal businesses in Canada and Corporate Business Canada. 
That said, you know, when you talk about statistics and without wanting to politicize the statement, you know, you have to remember that our First Nations just got the vote in 1961. So when we talk about statistics, well, we're talking about something here. Once again, this is the social change that our First Nations, our Aboriginal peoples, have changed since 1961. We're becoming more educated. We are getting with the program. And I think the program is to be successful in business. And when you talk about statistics, um, you know, we at uh, CCAB, we've got a, a, a great research department that is working on building our own statistics. Because for so long, we've been at the mercy of other people's statistics. You know, one statistic that I think is really fantastic and one that I'm happy to share with you is that 23% of Aboriginal employment in Canada today is in the forestry industry. And that is a real positive signal. And that's one statistic that I, that I can share. But we're working now on national surveys, provincial surveys, on uh, Aboriginal business in this country. And I think that those will be exciting things to share with you in the future. Great. When it, you want to speak about your organization and the use of the data and the public policy discourse and making sure we're protecting all those values we as a society want to protect? Uh, yeah, well, I mean, I mentioned, that, you know, the use of geographic information systems uh, and the different data sets uh, or information, uh, data and then use of information from that on different values. And so when you're managing the forest landscape, the public landscape in Canada, I mean, Canadians have clearly shown many surveys that they care about a range of values. Yes, the economics and the jobs, but also about the wildlife, the species at risk. And, you know, we have laws uh, to govern a lot of these things. And so it's ensuring that you're looking at uh, that we're combining those different types of data in, in analysis and saying, so where are the challenges? Where do we know, say, certain species are at risk or really at risk? Um, and some of the challenges, I think, for the forest sector is that in particular jurisdictions, that you have such an overlap of development activities, uh, such as in Alberta, where you have not just forestry, but you have uh, mining and oil and gas, that th the landscape is very fragmented, which, say, isn't good for woodland caribou. Uh, and some of the populations are basically not sustainable. So you need to kind of look at that and say, how do you, wh what are the most important values and how do you try and adjust for uh, and account for the economic side of things, but also for the ecological and social cultural values there. And, and also land rights, Aboriginal title, et cetera, um, uh, traditional rights that all these could be combined and you can layer those types of information we do to try and create information from the data for people to use and then making decisions. And, and I think that's where there's uh, always trying to be clear about what does the, you know, what's the, what is, what's the underlying data and what are the limitations on it. Uh, one of the big challenges in Canada is with, I think, the ecological data. Um, you know, it's like in forestry. I'm not a forester, I'm a geographer, but uh, or a biologist, but you need on the ground information related to wildlife as well. And we often don't have good enough information on, say, uh, species ranges and habitats to be able to really w uh, manage all those, our use of the landscape so we're not uh, curtailing the use of landscape for other species. That's one of the big challenges and where I think we need to continue to have public dialogue to try and improve our management for a broader range of values. Um, I'm going to give a five-minute warning to the audience here and on the web. Uh, we'll open it up uh, for dialogue and questions, comments, and interventions in a few minutes. So uh, start uh, preparing your thoughts. Um, and in the remaining uh, couple of minutes we have as a, a panel, uh, I, what I've heard so far is we're on a journey of continuous improvement. We're improving the data all the time. We're bringing in new uh, uh, technology, satellite technology, LIDAR, uh, and the, the uh, 400 square meter uh, analysis. We're uh, continuously improving our uh, uh, knowledge and relationships with First Nations communities. It's a, it's a journey of, of improvement on social, economic, and environmental, uh, something we can be proud of as Canadians, but there's still lots more to be done. So uh, maybe the, the, the question to give uh, each of our panelists an opportunity to, to uh, summarize their thoughts for, before we open it up to the floor 
in this journey of continuous improvement, what's the next couple of things you'd like to see us do as we continue our sustainable management of Canada's forests? Who wants to start? Well, I can start. <laughs> I can start. This isn't a budget <laughs> ask now, eh? <laughs> no, I guess it's, it's a bit more conceptual. I think the challenge we have in Canada is that, is that we're really, in terms of population, we're a small country and we have a huge natural asset, huge landscapes, two million square kilometers of, ma of managed forest, more or less, and another two million of unmanaged uh, forest. Uh, uh, so, so huge, huge forest landscape and with a small population. Uh, the, uh, the ability to monitor that forest is, is limited by, by, by our economic means, really. Uh, and we do, our, we do a very good job. But uh, then uh, when it talked about uh, the products from the WRI, World Resource Institute, uh, the, the danger for us, I think, is uh, to be defined, we end up being defined by others because they have uh, other data sets and they interpret those data sets with their own mind's eye of what's going on, with their own terminology. And these may be Americans, like right now it's happening, but it may be the future Japanese or Europeans that have their own satellite constellation going up and they can look at the world, they can look at us, they can look at Brazil, and they can interpret data in their own way. And, and that becomes the public language, the public discourse. And as Canadians, I think we, we should, you know, it's almost like a question of, of sovereignty over our, our interpretation of what we're doing and our, and our ability to define our own agenda in terms of, of uh, of management of our landscapes, of the public discourse we want to have over that, not being defined by others, I think is a very, very important point uh, that we have to uh, make sure that uh, it happens. Not be defined by others. And interesting. Thank you. Thank you. When it, if uh, you could make some recommendations for how we continue this journey of continuous improvement, what, what would you be suggesting? Um, well, I think always you know, as a geographer, I, I would say that having data and information at multiple scales is a good thing because different values need to be, um, can be seen in different lights or different information can come from the data if you look at it at different scales. Um, I think that there's uh, a need for and use for uh, global data sets because we have global issues to deal with, like climate change. We can't solve those kind of issues in one country. So we need to be able to assess some things at, at a global level. Um, however, I think at n the national level, we can continue to improve our, our data and our products. And uh, you mentioned the, the World Resources Institute and, and the global forest, uh, sorry, the intact forest landscapes. And actually, you know, they, they agree with us and they're actually supporting us right now to do a Canadian, our Canadianized version of the intact forest landscape for Canada because we treat fires in a slightly different way than uh, the Russian method, which was the beginning of that method. So if you compare our past layers with, with the intact layer global one, there's different numbers. Um, and so we can always improve, can continue, continue to improve our national uh, data and, and so that we can, because you need that to make good decisions at a national or regional provincial level. Um, so I would say continue there, and I would say, you know, my, one of my recommendations would be uh, to ha continue to have public discussions and to share information and data and information uh, from government with, with civil society and, and forest sector. For example, we have data, a data layer on protected areas. Um, well, that's the, the kind of legislative ones, but we know there's lots of de facto conservation areas in forest management areas. But getting access to that data in a way that we can say, okay, so how much area is there really protected is, is a challenge. So I would, I would say, throw it a challenge, say, can we have a better dialogue about sharing information that can help all of us have a better picture? So that it's not environmentalists over here with one piece of information and government over here with another. That we do all have information we can more readily share, I think. And that mm -hmm. would be my recommendation that we go forward from here. And I've been reaching out to, and I just started uh, as executive director in January of Global Forest Watch Canada. And, and one of my goals is to build very solid relations with parties, like uh, the forest companies, with like the government, who have data that we don't have, but that can be, if shared, can help us all do a better job of, of managing our, our landscapes. 
forest companies, business, and aboriginal communities. You know, um, forest companies are uniquely positioned to have strong, long-standing relationships with aboriginal communities. Many forestry companies have been working in remote communities for 50 or 100 years. Aboriginal communities can and do provide strong and local workforces in these remote communities. So I say to you, in a way to do this, what we're talking about is do take a look at our PAR program. And remember, it's not just for big corporations. It's also for the smaller, more you know, active uh, businesses that are closer and more involved with our First Nations. I, I think that's really important. And because you know, I don't get the opportunity to be sitting up here speaking to you all, uh, we at CCAB just created our first in-industry magazine, The Aboriginal Business Report. And uh, I brought a few copies. If anybody would like a copy, I would be glad to share that with you. I also have copies of the uh, PAR program to share with you as well. And I just want to say that uh, I really do believe that uh, understanding, respect, and trust is a mutual thing. And uh, thank you. Terrific. So we want to make sure we're not defined by others. We want to make sure we share the research and, and the data and, and make sure we understand the assumptions and the terminologies behind everybody's data. And we want to make sure we continue to build progressive Aboriginal relations, or PAR, as Andre terms it. Um, why don't we now turn the floor open to those of you in the room. I see lots of uh, professionals and people with far more knowledge on this subject than I have. And uh, I know there is twice as many people uh, joining us via the webinar as there are in the room. So we want to make sure we have time and opportunity for people uh, making uh, interventions, submissions, questions, comments from the internet as well. Uh, I once again remind people to please use the microphones uh, in order that everybody can hear both in the room and uh, online. And uh, those of you in the room and online, please uh, introduce yourself. Those of you we can't see on the web, uh, make sure you tell us uh, your name and the organization you're from. And likewise, uh, those in the room, and I'm pausing as long as I can while the lineups form behind the microphones. <laughs> <clears throat> uh, hello, uh, my name is Don Roberts, I'm the CEO of Nuweka Capital. Um, you know, it's clear that we've got a plethora of, of data out there, but um, perhaps we have a, a paucity of data or information on the economic supply of fiber. And, and, and that's a, quite a challenge for new entrants into the industry. Um, because when we're looking at um, new opportunities, it turns out the delivered cost of biomass is often as much as 70% of the variable cost. So that's something that they need to know. Um, now that information is out there and it's with the existing forest products companies. Um, and I think one could take the view, it, that's a group that also has a, um, not an overabundance of innovative capacity. And, and so how do we get this information into the public domain um, so that we can get some new folks with new ideas, with the information they need to introduce some transformative ideas? And I guess, David, this probably as much pointed to you as, as, as anyone because um, they're your constituency. And, and I guess the last point, it's a constituency which is essentially involved with the private use of a public resource. Excellent question, Don. And uh, different provinces, uh, again, uh, uh, David Mitchell, uh, we're back to Section 91 and Section 92 of the Constitution. Uh, different provinces uh, have different uh, ways of managing their forests, and uh, uh, the forest management planning process that I'm most familiar with is Ontario. I was the deputy in Ontario for a number of years. And so there are uh, open forums. Uh, they must uh, have uh, community engagement uh, and engagement of stakeholders every time they submit a forest management plan. So that the data on what's available and what is planned to be harvested and what is termed as a set-aside is publicly information. How you value that data is individual companies will value it differently. Uh, they'll set the, they have their proprietary decisions on how they value uh, extracting that. If it's a community-managed forest, uh, it's put out to tenure and, and people can bid on it. If it's a uh, 
uh, managed for us by one of the mills, uh, they have proprietary uh, information and they don't make that public. So there's a public policy discussion to be had there, uh, but right now, uh, the way the forest management planning process works in Ontario, if others in the room have, have experience from other jurisdictions, we certainly want to share it here. Um, but in Ontario, the knowledge of where the trees are and what's planned to be harvested and what's available for harvest is public. How much it's costing them to extract that and what the opportunity costs are of not extracting that, the companies consider that proprietary. There's policy ways to deal with that, but we need some provincial representatives in the room to speak to that. Are there any follow-ups on that point? All right, we have one more at the audience uh, microphone here, and if uh, anyone's on the internet, please uh, type in your submissions, and we'll uh, get those read out for you as well. Bonjour, Etienne Bélanger, uh, Directeur Forestier à l'Association des Produits Forestiers du Canada. Uh, thank you all for your, your great speech. Excellent discussion. I have uh, one question uh, regarding the, uh, so foresters are accountable to the public. They're professional. They're working mostly in uh, public forest. But, uh, and a lot of the information and the data we're working with is public in nature, but it's not, as Winnet pointed out, uh, readily available or easily accessible all the time. Uh, and there's sometimes reluctance or pros and cons in making this more accessible as as Pierre pointed out, you get interpreted in various ways or even misinterpreted. So what are the tools and approaches that can help make it more appealing to make it more transparent, so to build more trust, but that would help to carry the story with the data uh, to make the information um, in a way that uh, explain how and why the forest management decisions are made rather than just open to interpretation? Or any suggestions or? advise on that. Great. Good question, HM. The, uh, so uh, there's, there's two, if I could break down your question into two pieces, what I'm hearing is uh, uh, how do we make the data, data more uh, readily available and then you sort of have an implied question there, how do we make sure well, the analytics are right? Am I so putting words in your mouth? how do we make it available in ways that in some way carries the explanation for uh, the situation or how the decisions that were made create that situation? Okay, I love Rather that. than just having a, a map that anyone can then interpret in, in the ways they wish, so how, how in some ways we uh, carry uh, from, from what we've made to what it created. Okay, I can now freely confess I'm technically beyond my competency, so I will turn it over to <laughs> Pierre and win it. Well, uh, it is a challenge across Canada because forests are provincially managed, really their provincial jurisdictions, and, and, and provinces you know, have their own ways, each of them have their own ways of, of, of uh, gathering data, or not gathering data, depending on the strength of their local industry. You know, those provinces that have very small industry don't feel compelled to gather as much data, but yet they have large forest landscapes. Uh, and so, you know, I can speak for my organization, we've had a, a program going with provinces to develop a national forest inventory. So that was the first time that we've had uh, the ability to have a, a national picture of Canada's forest, uh, homogeneous to describe from one province to the other. Uh, you know, things as, as simple as I was talking about soils, I'm a scientist of course, so I talk about you know, tiny things. So soils, <laughs> um, trying to get a picture of, of soil fertility, which is the basis for productivity, and which is important for trying to project future forest growth in a cl changing climate. Having uh, comparable measurements made across Canada you know, and if our national forest inventory has managed to do that, but it's the first time we've been able to have a coherent picture of forest soils across Canada, even though it's very imperfect. And so, as we bring the partners at the table and we start showing them the benefits of pooling data and how that can feed back to their own processes or their own ability to uh, uh, to say to the world or forest or, or describe it such and such in a coherent way and see is how they're changing over time due to this and that cause coherently, and that really enables them to have better market opportunities abroad. You know, as those benefits are being uh, hopefully uh, brought to provinces and, and, uh, and they understand that, then we'll have a better and better coherence in, in data sharing, I guess, and, and common products across, across Canada. But uh, 
it's uh, their history behind each province and their history behind how they treat that data. It's, a, it's cultural issues. It's you know, it's uh, it's it's something that is changing over time. Uh, and, and there's nothing negative about where it's coming from, but it's good to, to have that evolving as the world is becoming more linked. Globally, we have to be more linked internally also in Canada in terms of, of our understanding of, of data and our data sets. So, but it's, uh, it's, you know, getting a picture of Canada's force coherently, coast to coast, is, uh, is uh, still a bit of a challenge, but it's, we're getting there. Good. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a communication issue that, uh, you know, it goes beyond my competency in terms of how do you communicate sometimes ideas and ensure that people understand what it means, you know, so that, that forest loss, it, as in a change in forest cover, for example, doesn't get automatically interpreted as meaning deforestation, which we know has been a, a, a challenge with some data recently. I do think there's some things that, uh, I won't name any jurisdictions, but I was looking on, online this week saying, okay, where can I, what provinces can I get forest management plans from online? And, and not all, you can't from every province. And so, you know, there's just some basic things like sharing data. I mean, I was a bit shocked to find that at this day and age in Canada that there's not like PDFs of certain products online that Canadians can get access to. Uh, another example was I was looking at one uh, agency had a very nice description of compliance monitoring that was done in the forest management units. But you actually then, if you wanted to look at any of those reports, you had to actually write to the individual forest districts to get copies of those. Once again, it's like, it, it, I think it would go a long way to kind of instilling uh, trust and, and uh, understanding if you make that information available to the public. In this day and age in Canada, why am I going to have to be writing to each individual forest district to get a compliance monitoring report? It, it you know, I think we can do better. And, and uh, so there's some just basic things like that. And then summaries of, uh, online of what is this product? And here's what you should know when you're looking at it. And, and monitoring the trends over time. Yeah. Uh, that, that would be a big step. And it's, there's lots of progress, but we still have uh, further to go. The, the challenges of big data are in, in many sectors and parts of the economy, not just forestry. I think it was mm -hmm. uh, Don Tapscott's book, uh, Wikonomics. He, uh, the, the first chapter of his book talks about a mining company in, in northern Canada that had all kinds of maps and, uh, uh, well, uh, Don Roberts' question about uh, the economic uh, interests of forest companies and the analysis of the value of the forest mining companies protecting their uh, claims and uh, information their claims is uh, incredibly valuable uh, but read the first chapter of Don Tapscott's book they actually put it out on the web they invited the world to analyze the data and they discovered uh, uh, huge new uh, gold deposits mm -hmm. through uh, global sourcing crowdsourcing of, uh, of data so there are examples in other sectors where sharing the data on the web uh, does make good economic sense, and I, I, I reference you to Don Tapscott's book. We've got a question at the microphone to my left. Stavie with the Canadian Parks and Wilderness Society. And one thing that struck me, and you, you sort of touched on this a little bit in your discussion, is that what people are interested in is also driving the collection of data and so, you know, if you're interested in soil productivity from, for tree growth perspectives, you might invest in that more than other types of data. And so I'm wondering from your perspective, um, over time, how have you seen uh, trends in what people are interested in, whether it's the forestry industry or NGOs or other groups, how is that changing the data that's being collected um, and potentially also then shared? And Great. maybe where is the future? You know, what, what, is, what are the types of information that we haven't been collecting that maybe we need to start collecting more carefully? Great question. Who wants to take that one? Win it? Um, yeah, no, that's a great, it is a great question. And I mean, I think it is right. Often what gets uh, measured gets monitored and gets reported on. And there hasn't always been as comprehensive data on some on wildlife, on, on biological values, for example, as I mentioned, mentioned earlier. And we need to have information on that. And I think um, public or First Nation demands for certain types of information can help 
can help drive that. Um, I think there's also internationally a, a kind of a growing recognition that, say, GDP as a measure of wealth isn't good enough, that that doesn't capture our wealth as a nation or a, as individual nations, and so that we need to do a better job of measuring other aspects of our, um, not just the economic development, but the natural capital, the human capital, the social capital. Uh, and as Canadians, I think we need to kind of demand that so it does get um, measured so that we can then analyze it and, and monitor it. There's been backward steps in some areas, I won't go into in detail, but in terms of some of the uh, data that is not now being collected in the same way on, say, uh, human dimensions, you know, on, uh, say, in terms of the census, well, I'm going to mention it, the census, for example. How do we do a good job of public policy in, if we don't have a long-form census that gives us ongoing data that allows us to monitor change over time and what the needs are of Canadian citizens? Um, so there's been some backward steps in some areas and progress in others. And as Canadians, uh, we have rights, but we also have responsibilities to ask for the things that we want to have measured so that we can do a better job of uh, managing our economy, our society, and our, our environment. Andre, I, I, I'm sure this is not part of the work that the uh, Canadian Aboriginal Business Council does, but uh, uh, the use of traditional knowledge and uh, uh, burial sites, uh, trapping lines, uh, summer hunting grounds, winter hunting grounds, that's, that's a, a big body of knowledge uh, that, that the First well, Nations want to bring to the table as well. That, that, that's a huge domain and one that I, I couldn't possibly comment on from my personal knowledge, but all I want to say is that I agree completely with what Wynette just said. <laughs> that's all I have to say. <laughs> Great. Uh, there, did you have a comment, Peter? Are you okay? Uh, well, uh, on, on the gathering of data, uh, gathering data costs money, uh, and so uh, and it comes out of public purse or, or, or from the pockets of, of private uh, stakeholders, and, and so what's been driving it really, from a public perspective, really usually is mandated uh, information requirement for 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 compliance with legislation or, 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 uh, or regulations. And so you know, we now monitor uh, water quality, for example, for, from forestry operations, because it was mandated a long time ago across most jurisdictions that you had to protect water quality. And so in, in many areas, they, they look at water quality now. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. uh, so, so if, and the public concern, once it's translated into regulations, then usually the, the monitoring follows. Now, if, if that's where the public uh, policy and the, you know, how the public can influence the system uh, through the regular routes uh, really acts. Now, if there is a, a major concern on, on, a, on a hot, new hot topic, then it's, it's harder to get, I think, uh, from my perspective, uh, good data on the ground from just uh, something that's not really legislated or regulatory based. So, uh, so and from, uh, from our perspective, uh, I, I'm a federal uh, uh, civil servant, so we work on, on international issues a, a lot. So uh, our driver for data gathering is really what we need to report to, to the international community. And this is why we need the Canada-wide data in our case, right, because we right. report on Canada-wide issues. Uh, and so you know, it depends each uh, stakeholder that, that has uh, uh, required needs for data will spend the money to do that. So if, and so if, if the public the stakeholder, they have to, be, they have to, be, they have to have a voice, basically, to push for that data agenda mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. forward. And, and I assume in the gathering of the data, there, there's a temporal challenge as well. Uh, you know, it takes 40, 60 years yes. to, to, to regrow a forest after a fire or, or uh, the, the, the it, it, speaking of species, uh, bald eagle population in Northern Ontario uh, 30 years ago is totally different today yeah. uh, as a result of uh, uh, DDT elimination and lots of things. So th there's a temporal component yeah. to, to data. What the data may tell us today may not be what it tells us 25 years ago or 25 years yes. from now. Yeah, there is an immense value in long-term data. Mm. The data gets more valuable as you keep gathering over time. Yeah, yeah. I don't see anyone at the microphones. Do we have uh, anyone online? Oh, we got one here. Okay, my name is Sylvain Poirier. I'm an executive director at the Collège Communautaire de New Brunswick. And uh, I, 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 I like uh, what I'm seeing today in terms of discussions, uh, transparency, etc. 
and the importance of, of, of data, the use of data, uh, because data are also at the basis of uh, indicators, key indicators. And one thing I saw in the documentation that was circulated, and perhaps will come up as a, a come out as a more like a question for the industry as well as the government. Uh, uh, like I come from a from a town in Dalhousie where we used to have a paper mill, which is no longer there. So when I see indicators. Uh, stating, for example, that there's been a reduction in pollution and a reduction in, in, in waste and things like that, and it's starting, uh, it's based on 1990, for example, or 2005. What I'm wondering is if the closure and the, the fact that some of these mills are no longer there is also taken into consideration to readjust the, the data, or the, the, the information that is presented to the public. Hmm. Uh, we actually have 12 metrics in, in the reporting that we're doing, and uh, we have some staff here who can help go through each of them for you. So some of them are absolute reductions, and some of them are relative reductions. So we'll, we can get some staff to, to help break that out for you. But it's an excellent question. Uh, the uh, absolute number reductions are very good, and some of them are as a result of uh, smaller production. But relative on a mill-by-mill -mill basis, they're also moving in the right direction. So we're, we're quite proud of the trend lines, both in, in relative terms, maybe not in absolute terms. <laughs> Hello. So we have a question in, uh, from the webcast. And this comes from Sten Nilsson, who's a researcher based in Sweden. And he asked the panel, what are you going to do on Monday to improve the data situation with regards to Canadian forests? Thank you. <laughs> Vote. Excellent question, Stan. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, actually, we were going to go back to the office this afternoon, but you know, if, if you want us to wait till Monday, we certainly can. Um, who's, who's got a, a brilliant comeback to my friend Stan? Well, I, I think the data really is improving. It's a, it's a continuous improvement process. You know, it's a, uh, I appreciate the call from a colleague from Sweden. You know, Swedish has a very different national circumstances than we have in terms of their forest landscapes and their human population occupancy of the landscape. You know, we have a vast landscapes, uh, and and uh, we are, I guess, much newer at this game of measuring forests. But uh, we are, you know, incremental change is uh, is slow, but it's it's happening across landscape in terms of the quality of the data we can gather, and and the better focus we have on that data. It's not perfect. Uh, but I think it is. And the new tools that are coming in online from remote sensing, of course, are, are helping bringing that data together uh, and, and enabling us to do uh, analysis at levels that we weren't able to do before. So, uh, you know, so I, I think uh, the trend is good for forestry data in general and the ability to uh, get information out of that. Good. Win it. You got any thoughts for? Uh, uh, yeah. Well, my uh, I have colleagues right now that are actually digitizing things as <laughs> as we speak. So, uh, data sets are being improved. Um, I, in terms of uh, improving information products and analysis from data, I'm going to continue to reach out to to folks at uh, CFS. So I'm going to be going to Edmonton in a, in a week and meeting with some of the scientists there. I've told Pierre I want to follow up with him is we want to look at how do we use the products, say, from CFS and ARCAN to, uh, in conjunction with global data sets that WRI and, and uh, University of Maryland have done, the, the partnership of Global Forest Watch, to look at uh, better monitoring long term. So there's a couple of things we're going to be doing. Here. Well, uh, right. I would say that uh, expand engagement because once again, I'm coming at this not from a statistical or technical point of view. Expand that engagement to be more inclusive and then track that engagement and share that knowledge and see the improvements that could be there. I wouldn't want to lose Sten's point. I think it's an excellent point. I think all of us in the room and, and I recognize <coughs> a, a lot of uh, public servants and uh, private sector re representatives here and I know there's a number online and uh, colleagues in the uh, NGO community, so we should all challenge ourselves. What are we going to do when we go back to the offices next week and, and uh, improve not only the content of the data, but the analysis of the data? I think there's layering of analysis that needs to take place. And we need to respect where everyone's coming from. We're balancing social, economic, and environmental. So we need better data on all three 
and better integration. And I think Angie Ardini has some comments she's going to be making at lunch about that. David. Yeah, I'd like to ask a question, uh, David. I, fi I find this conversation uh, very provocative this morning. I mean, we live in a country where most of the forest resource is publicly owned. That differentiates us from many other uh, forestry regions of the world, forest producing regions of the world. And yet it's surprising that um, basic information, data, isn't more readily and easily accessible. Uh, it raises issues of accountability, transparency. Um, and uh, so clearly there's more work to be done in this area. And the benefits of doing more in this area, I think, have been alluded to by the panelists. And, uh, but it's, a, it's an interesting discussion because I, I like, David, your idea of uh, um, using techniques like crowdsourcing technologies and digital uh, technologies to allow uh, more transparency and um, more innovation, quite honestly. Uh, that's quite exciting, going back to Dan Ta uh, Don Tapscott's ideas. Um, I have a specific question uh, that is maybe building on some of the other uh, questions that were asked. Um, when it comes to an issue like climate change, for instance, if we wanted to understand the potential impact, not only short term, but medium and longer term, of climate change on the forest resource in Canada, uh, where would we get that information and how reliable would it be today? Well, let's we'll start with an expert. <coughs> Go ahead. As a matter of fact, we're <laughs> working on that. <laughs> no, it, it's, a, it's a good question because it's a, it's a complex issue, climate change. Uh, we actually have a program within our organization that's called Forest Change that's exactly dedicated to that very same issue, looking at how climate change will influence, is influencing <coughs> disturbance patterns, uh, is influencing the type of forest we're growing, uh, and, uh, and how that will impact the uh, uh, potential industrial processes down the road up to uh, uh, 2,100 uh, in, in 90 years from now, 85 years from now. So, so we are in the process of, of uh, building information on, on that issue. We already have things that are published. You know, we're scientists. We publish work on that. But it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a bit of a worrisome uh, future because uh, there is a lot of uncertainty. But uh, we're trying to put together uh, in interesting analysis on, on that right now. As we speak, actually, we had a meeting two weeks ago on that. Uh, trying to, uh, we're at the tip of the apex now of, of the analysis. So, and, that, and that should be uh, coming out, uh, I guess, in the next uh, few months. Very good. Thank you, Dr. Bernard. We've got uh, one at the microphone, and if there's any on the web, I'll do David, it. David, may I just quickly Sorry, say go, that, go ahead, that, you know, when you talk about climate change, uh, uh, once again, I'm not an expert on traditional knowledge, but I do know for a fact that out there, uh, there are elders who are seeing the effects of climate change and raising those alarms. And I would only hope that somewhere in this world of statistics that they are being engaged and that we are listening to that aspect of what's going on. Yes, actually, uh, it, it is well uh, documented, the fact that uh, traditional knowledge and, and, and just oral tradition, uh, uh, suddenly there is a mismatch between that and the new environmental uh, parameters. You know, bird species in the Arctic coming in that were never there, so they don't even have names for those birds uh, in their language. You know, clues like that that are showing that. Clear uh, indicators. Clear, and these are very important because the people have been on the landscape for thousands of years and they know the landscape, so it's a, it's a good point to raise, very important. We've got uh, just a time check uh, for uh, people on the web and people in the room. We've got uh, eight or less minutes uh, to go. So if you have questions or you think there's issues we have not yet uh, dive deeply enough into or scratch the surface even, we uh, encourage you to bring your questions forward in the remaining eight or 10 minutes. Over to this microphone. Uh, I'm Janet Bulkan, Faculty of Forestry, University of British Columbia. Thank you for a very interesting and provocative questions and the frankness this morning. So I'd be interested in hearing from our panelists, how, what would you recommend for Canada to encourage or get more discussions about around integrated land use planning at the provincial and then national levels, given the fragmented government structures of provincial authority over crown forests? And then as you mentioned, Pierre, the vastness of the landscapes. So Canada goes all over the world and talks about integrated land use planning. How might you get more of that here at home? 
David, it's always a constitutional question. Right? <laughs> <laughs> who, who wants to tackle uh, an excellent question? Thank you for joining us from, from UBC, Jen. I appreciate it. Yeah, how do we uh, do a better job? Well, I think there are land use planning processes underway in, in uh, provincial jurisdictions, and as it comes back to the, the Constitution, I think um, when provinces are doing work like that, they need to be inclusive, engage public, and engage different stakeholders, which they often do. And I think where there's, they're in eco-regions that are, uh, go across jurisdictional boundaries, they need to look at, at that. Um, I think, yeah, it's always that, that trickiness of how do you do the analysis at an ecological basis while you're working in within a, an administrative jurisdictional boundary. Right. So there can always be improvements on that. And I think it's just uh, trying to ensure better, the best information or data is being uh, inputted into those processes and analyzed, uh, that uh, it's inclusive and that um, it then gets considered at multiple levels. So what does it mean to have a, a Canadian-wide protected area network um, means you, know, you, you need to have a national picture of that, but then you also need to have a picture of what that means at each ecological region and what are, say, maybe the roles and responsibilities of each province towards that. And it, it's a challenging to try and get at that national picture, but I think ongoing uh, connection between provinces on that and with the uh, broader public is important. So just making sure processes are transparent, um, engaging people, and having the best data possible. I think what I'm going to say is probably exactly what you just said, but I'll say it from a different lens. You know, uh, I think that Canadians need to understand that out there from the business perspective, there are a lot of success stories between our First Nations and the forestry industry and uh, the business of forestry. And I think that if we could find some of those real success stories, turn it into a national story and share that that kind of, uh, of progress that we might find that we're building the dialogue and sharing the, the successes. And I think it's about sharing those successes. And uh, maybe a few comments. I think uh, uh, to have uh, always improving processes, I think more open data so that public can have access to that. You mentioned crowdsourcing. I think I really, I strongly believe in, in, in having uh, people access the data and do analysis on it from their perspective and bring different perspectives, kind of a crowdsourcing of analysis, uh, which would bring probably more diversity in, in planning processes. And, and also, I believe in, in very strong metrics uh, to, uh, to turn data into information. Metrics are always good. And uh, I, I like, personally, I like metrics that are not black and white, but that are uh, a continuum so that you can actually gauge the success, incremental success, not in, not in a yes or no, but in more shades uh, of color. So, you know, I, I, uh, intact forest landscape is one metric that I like for some aspects, but I don't like for others because of its binary nature, because of forest either intact or non-intact. So you, you can't manage that because uh, you can't reward somebody for doing you know, nearly intact because it's like one or zero. So, uh, so, so good metrics to see where your progress is when you do good planning and good data availability that people can access the, their, the, uh, the planning from a different perspective, basically, as compared to the, the kind of the, the focused one where you, one agent presents the analysis with his or her own perspective. So. You've, you've raised an excellent question, and I think we could, we could go on for, for an hour just on, on, on the issues you've, you've prompted, the uh, incremental metrics. I hadn't thought of it that way. That's fascinating. But, but uh, I saw one of our colleagues from Ducks Unlimited just came in the, the room a little while ago. So what is important for Don Roberts and mill costs is a certain geographical scope. What's important for uh, Aboriginal traditional hunting and trapping territories yes. is another scope. Exactly. What's important for an ecosystem and what's important for a flyway for ducks mm -hmm. is scalable uh, and the air shed and climate change is global so uh, it's not just a federal provincial issue uh, but it wouldn't be Canada if we didn't start with that one uh, I think we have one coming in from the web we do so it's a question from the web uh, from here in Ottawa Nancy Tupper from the Forest Products Association asks 
Do you believe that having the best environmental credentials in the world of any forest products industry is a competitive advantage for Canadian companies? And do you believe that greenness relates to prof profitability? I know Nancy, she's a keener. <laughs> <laughs> Who wants to pat us on the back? <laughs> I will. There we go. Uh, well, you know, I'll say that uh, if it's all true, <laughs> then it's the best and it's what we all want and as First Nations peoples, Aboriginal peoples in the country today, I mean the traditions have been of the land and to reap the wealth of the land and give back so I say kudos. Incremental metrics I think is important and uh, making sure that we're doing the best we can uh, is always what we should be striving for, but compared to many other jurisdictions, we're doing pretty darn well. There's another question from the web. This comes in from Danielle, and it's asked, how does a national forest inventory and other national data sets help small local forestry businesses make decisions? Ooh, that's a technical question, I'm not sure. Technical question. Yeah. Uh, National forest. Uh, we can produce regional products with that. It, it gets to be technical, you know. Of course, there's an issue of scale. We do those kind of inventories for national questions. Uh, uh, but in a sense, the kind of questions we tackle may help small businesses because we can pool data from the different jurisdictions and. and like predictions of climate change, for example, how where where the force is moving towards. You can't do that only locally. You have to pool data from all jurisdictions through uh, the national force inventory, force inventory and other means to understand where the force is heading and how sustainable your current practices are, considering the change in, in force environment in the future. So I guess that's locally relevant. Although you have to pool data from through uh, the NFI, the national force inventory, and other data sources. So it it is a challenge bringing those big data sets to bear on very local issues, but it's something that can be done, and it's, you know, it, there is relevancy there. Great. We've touched on lots of topics. We're running out of time. Uh, I'm gonna ask our panelists if they have any final one or two minute summation comments or things you wanted to make sure you raised today that you have not yet had an opportunity to raise. But I've heard that uh, we, we need to continuously improve. We need to continue to gather the data and analyze the data. We need to respect uh, all users of the landscape, uh, uh, Aboriginal traditional knowledge and the aspirations of our First Nations people, the economic interests of communities and our companies, and uh, make sure we're monitoring not just the trees, but the species and the water and, and, uh, and the soils. So there's uh, lots we've done to get where we are today, and there's lots more we can be doing, but we should be, uh, I think, relatively proud of the journey we've been on since uh, David Mitchell started us uh, with his story of his childhood and the war in the woods. Uh, we've, we've come a long way, and uh, we should pause and reflect on that. But uh, I'll turn it over to the panelists if you have any final comments before we uh, run out of time. Sure. Um, the PAR program, it's not a political tool. We are about business, building business, business on the ground for the betterment of companies and communities. And I want to applaud Alberta, Alberta Pacific, who is a Gold PAR member. I want to applaud Timber West, who is a CCAB member. And I want to appeal to you, the forestry industry, to consider the work that the Canadian Council for Aboriginal Business is doing. And on that final note, I just want to say that, you know, I sit here and I really feel confident and optimistic about presenting all the real great positives that are out there. But I wouldn't have to be sitting here if we didn't realize that there are issues with Aboriginal First Nations across the country. There are issues. And that's why I'm here. And that's why I stand strongly behind the work that we do behind uh, the PAR program. And in closing, I want to say thank you very much for this opportunity, David, and to David and to my fellow um, panelists and to all of you. Thank you. Yeah, I guess I would just like to say in closing, I'd just like to highlight that, uh, you know, the organization I work for, Global Forest Watch Canada, we're committed to helping to uh, create and share good data and, and good information products that, that come from that data that we are interested in collaborating 
with, with others to ensure that we have good data and good information to understand how we're managing our landscapes. So, um, yeah, that, and this has been a very important opportunity to have a, dis uh, an opportunity to have a discussion uh, with people about our work, about uh, the progress and, and the challenges and the opportunities that uh, Canada faces in managing its forests. And I would also like to thank my thank David and David and my fellow panelists and all of you for uh, listening to us. And it's uh, it's been great exchange from my perspective. So thank you. Great. Thank you. Uh, I'll I'll come back on, on my theme of uh, maybe uh, the uh, remote sensing and the global we're under global surveillance really in the sense that uh, the world sees us. The world sees all we're doing from remote sensing. The resolution of those satellites is getting better and better. You, we used to. I looked at a paper recently that was from the uh, 90s, and they were looking at, at pixels, like squares of the ground, where it's like the, the smallest dot you can see was 64 square kilometers, eight by eight kilometers, you know, from the, and that was high resolution. Now we're doing to 30 meters, random, you know, basically routinely, and we'll be down to finer resolution. We'll see basically tracks on the ground from Japan or from wherever, space agency. So basically we're being, followed, tracked by the world. So it's very important, I think, for, for us Canadians to be, be able to, to uh, generate our own story about our force from our data sets and from our analysis, from our knowledge, from you know, what were uh, you know, the Aboriginal use of the landscape, uh, the forestry companies, the regeneration. We don't see re forest regeneration from, from satellites because if the trees are too small, after 10 years, you go, in, you go in a clear cut or you go in a, in a burnt area, the trees will be made, not even a meter tall and they'll be sparse, but they, that's a future forest. And so you can't see that from a satellite. That's why the forest cover loss issue, I think, is, is quite dramatic because it conveys an image of, of really destruction of our forest, whereas really the satellites don't see the trees that are growing back, they're just too small. So, so the ability that we have to gather knowledge from across Canada, from all the jurisdictions, and put it forward publicly, I think is very, very important. It's, it's getting more and more important as more of the world is, is trying to see what we're doing from satellites, basically. Excellent discussion. We're uh, out of time. We've uh, uh, had uh, three great panelists uh, stimulate our thoughts and get us going this morning. I know we've got another good session coming up, but I'd like you to join me in thanking our participants in this first session this morning. Well done. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Thank you. So ladies and gentlemen, we'll take a short uh, break for 15 minutes and we'll be back with our next discussion. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, we're going to commence now with our second discussion of the morning. Uh, that was the first discussion, I hope you'll agree with me, was uh, really interesting, very provocative, raised lots of questions for me that um, uh, I'd love to continue with. Uh, but we're going to now switch gears a little bit with our next discussion panel, which is going to focus on the global context. And uh, it's my pleasure to introduce you to the moderator of this panel, Glenn Mason, who is Assistant Deputy Minister of the Canadian Forest Service at Natural Resources Canada. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Glenn Mason. Good morning, thank you. And that uh, first panel was a wonderful, I think, lead-in to this conversation about uh, global go governance and, uh, and uh, market-driven mechanisms and the role of First Nations in forestry. The Canadian Forest Service is the national voice of forestry in Canada. We carry out a lot of science uh, in support of sustainable forest management. Uh, st strategic science that, as uh, the earlier uh, moderator pointed out, supports the owners of the forest, which in Canada uh, at about 94% uh, is or are the provinces, primarily. And so in that, uh, in that role, we're very concerned about the sustainable use and sustainable management of our forests. We're also concerned about how Canada is perceived internationally. We're concerned about how we measure up. You probably know that Canada has some 140 million hectares of certified forest, more than any other country in the world. We're gonna to be touching on that this morning in terms of its implications. 
you have the biographies of our, of our distinguished panelists here. Ben is an award-winning professor from Yale University, a specialist in the role of market-driven mechanisms. Janet is an assistant professor at the forestry faculty at UBC, particular specialty in Aboriginal forestry, and has spent a fair bit of time in Guyana and Suriname, which I think is totally cool, because I lived in uh, Guyana for three years, and if you want to see some amazing tropical forests, you have to go to Guyana. And uh, on this side, Aaron O'Carroll. Aaron's the executive director of the CBFA, the Canadian Borough Forest Agreement. And uh, with that, I think we'll get started. And I think perhaps we can start with Ben. Uh, ben, you have a particular uh, expertise on non-state market-driven environmental governance. You've done a fair bit of work in this on the past, uh, perhaps a little bit less, perhaps around 10 years ago, and you, you really mm -hmm. actually looked at Canada, benchmark Canada uh, against uh, other countries. How would you say today, how would you say Canada's measuring up? Um, well, first of all, let me uh, say that it's great to be here and to be part of this really uh, important uh, discussion. Um, and I also want to say as a, as a Canadian, and somebody who spent nine years uh, in Ottawa, thank you for the snow this morning. That was a very <laughs> special treat. Um, I thought what I would do to answer that question is to stand back a little bit. It's always dangerous to ask a professor who's used to speaking in one hour increments to speak for three minutes. But I'm gonna just give you a little uh, sort of sense of what I want to do, which is to have us engage in a conversation. So treat this as a seminar versus cash or saying something definitive, okay? So I'm gonna raise some hypotheses in my talks, and I'd love to have a conversation about them. So to answer your question specifically, I think uh, uh, a lot of the attention on Canada the last 25 years uh, has in fact produced some really extraordinary uh, results that I think have lessons for other efforts other, elsewhere in the world as well. So Canada, when it comes to forest regulations and forest practices in many respects, has some of the uh, most um, prescriptive standards uh, globally when you compare to other countries. And the question is, what do we do with that knowledge? What does that do for promoting uh, responsible forest governance, not just in Canada, but globally as well? So what I wanna say, I wanna argue, I wanna argue, I wanna hypothesize that all the attention on data, which is fantastic, and standards development, by the way, Canadians are always constantly changing your forest practices standards. Okay, when it comes to certification or controlled wood or regulations, you're always changing. And it makes it very difficult for academics to study this stuff because you're always changing. So I'm gonna ask you for a moratorium on standards for just two years so we can actually get up to speed on this, okay? So, but why? Adaptive management. But adaptive management, but it's hard to keep up. So, but we can stand back and say, well, why? Are these changes always happening? What's, what, it, what is behind this? And so we need more attention, I would argue, not just to the standards content themselves, and not just in the data itself, as we learned this morning, but also on why support for these standards is occurring. And what does that mean for responsible forest governance globally and how Canada can improve that? Um, and what I want to argue is that when you think about then why support occurs, really important policy implications emerge about how to use different instruments from protected areas, land use questions, to certification, to market mechanisms, okay? So just a teaser, this is the overall gist, right? Is that um, uh, each instrument that one employs has a different kind of logic as to how support would occur and implications for influence. And I can't give you my hour long lecture, so here's the little two words I want to leave you with to reinforce this point. And the two words are California and effect, okay? Which is two words, we can all remember that, you know, it's easy. When you see me next time, don't say Ben Cash or say California effect guy, okay? So what is this effect? That I wanna argue Canada is more important than California for this effect. So what is the effect? The effect is when uh, companies who operate in relatively highly regulated markets, okay? and this is in fact many Canadian provinces have very high regulations, see it in their strategic self-interest, okay, the economic valuations, to align with environmental groups and social activists to champion the similar rules elsewhere, okay, elsewhere in the world. And what happens there is you create a coalition 
of actors who have different organizational interests coming together to create a collective good. You know, this happened in California, where California, which believes in a lot of rules, uh, companies were overregulated. They argued, and they said, okay, if we can't reduce the rules, can we at least have our other competitors have the same rules? Okay. Now, this is important because it may be that the biggest impact of forest certification, for example, which is a broad mechanism that's really important in Canada, but also globally, may not be to have impacts in Canada itself. That may be at the margins. The biggest impact might be if you get enough coalition of companies and NGOs trying to increase other companies elsewhere up to the Canadian standards. Okay? Now, has this worked in practice? This, means, this makes some intuitive sense. Right? You could actually get companies in the tropics and other, in, in Russia, for example, to be up to the Canadian standards. Um, but the implications for strategy have not been followed, I would argue. So what's one example, and then I'll, I'll, I'll stop my, I'm now over my three minutes. The example is this. 15 years ago, seven of the top 10 forest companies in British Columbia wanted to support and looked at supporting the Forest Stewardship Council, which is seen as having the more prescriptive standards than the SFI and, and CSA. However, what happened was, and the reason for that was that the forest companies themselves had just undergone massive public policy changes in forest practices to the tune of creating $6 billion in costs. Okay? So the companies saw the FSC as potentially giving some kind of recognition for this that would then help to increase standards elsewhere in the world. But instead what happened was the FSC increased their standards much higher than the government regulations, and the companies didn't see an economic value they saw actually increased costs and most, most walked away. Um, and so we lost an the opportunity there, there to actually build impact somewhere else in the world that I think would have been a more effective instrument for certification. So I'll stop there, but that's the kind of the theme I want to talk about. How do we go from thinking about why support occurs to actually have important impacts on the ground? Um, and by the way, on the land use side, likewise, I think Canada has a lot to offer as well, and the mechanisms for support are actually different than the ones for certification. Thanks, that's a very interesting uh, analysis. Now, Janet, you're actually on the policy committee of FSC. Could you uh, perhaps interject on this and uh, speak also to your international comparisons? Well, um, Ben has introduced a lot of points there. The policy and standards committee of FSC looks at, uh, super, uh, edits and reviews the normative documents of FSC uh, progressively because FSC being an ISO accredited organization is committed to a five-year reviews of all of its normative documents so eventually it will see all the national standards of all the countries who which have companies that are FSC certified um, Ben's point about the FSC standard becoming more prescriptive and therefore uh, in the BC context and having companies that, that companies walked away from it is one that's endlessly debated within uh, voluntary organizations like FSC. What, what I, can, I can't speak for FSC, but I would, uh, again, just, sort of just mention or highlight that it is a voluntary scheme, and those companies that do belong to it um, do so because it opens up market share. It gives them the, so very often, in some cases, gives them the social license to operate on uh, a terrain, a territory which, in which there are, is not just as you mentioned, crown owned or crown claimed lands, but indigenous claims to those lands as well. And the market driven uh, ideas that Gwen, uh, Ben has mentioned. So I think uh, FSC's membership drives a lot of the need for higher standards to differentiate it from maybe the race to the bottom. And this is going to be a complete, uh, it's always going to be an interesting debate in different contexts. I think one of the values of F, uh, FSC is that, and it's perhaps what drove my question to the first panel, was that because it creates a space for a multi-stakeholder process, you can bring different constituency groups to the same table, and uh, not just for one-off meetings, but in a more regulated, um, statutory way, so that they can begin to unpick these issues and see where they might be accommodation, where they might be both participation and accommodation towards an end goal, which very often they find that they share. That thank, would be my sense. Thank you, Janet. Now, Aaron, you're the executive director of the CBFA. 
I suspect most people in the room know that what the CBFA is. Uh, perhaps you could take a minute to explain that and, and give some of the history of, 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 of that organization, that, that agreement, but also speak to the FSC point, because uh, I think I'm correct in, in, in suggesting that the CBFA uh, has endorsed and or uses the FSC standard. Well, uh, thank you, Glenn. Uh, let me just say it's a, a real pleasure to be here with uh, my esteemed uh, colleagues on this panel and, and with uh, this uh, impressive uh, audience here today, both in the room, and, uh, and thank you to those who are participating online. Um, I, I am the executive director of the Secretariat, which supports the almost 30 signatory organizations of uh, the Canadian Boreal Forest Agreement. And uh, the agreement, uh, speaking of the global context, has as its uh, primary objective to set a global precedent for conservation of Canada's boreal ecosystem, which is our largest terrestrial ecosystem, but also to ensure that Canada is recognized as the global, globally preferred source of supply for uh, forest products. So we're an organization very much with a, a mission to set a precedent on the global stage. Uh, we're a voluntary organization, much in the way that uh, certification is a voluntary initiative and FSC is a voluntary uh, organization. In that sense, the signatories to the CBFA um, support the organization by their continued participation in it. Um, the, uh, the agreement is a, a real model to try to find solutions to some of the significant challenges that we have. Um, Ben's uh, suggesting that the, the challenges that we see are in fact global, they certainly are, um, but that's not to overlook that we have uh, challenges uh, here at home. And um, we heard their panelists this morning talking about uh, that, and I, you know, I'd summarize that, you know, the current debate in Canada, if you will, is, is dominated by discussions of the challenges of sustainable natural resource development, uh, about the challenge of reconciling with uh, Aboriginal Canadians, uh, and the challenge of finding solutions to our major environmental and conservation issues. Um, the, uh, and the CBFA really is uh, and, and voluntary sector initiative to try to find mm -hmm. solutions to the, some of those challenges in, in a way that um, gets us beyond the adversarial history that uh, David reminded of, us of when he uh, introduced this panel this morning, uh, in a way that um, brings us to collaboration as, as the preferred uh, solution to addressing these pressing challenges. Um, and that ultimately is what the CBFA is about, and uh, collaboration is a challenging uh, thing to do. We talk about it, I think, um, offhandedly sometimes, uh, but it is, it, it's a very significantly diff uh, difficult thing to do. Uh, you were hinting at some of the challenges that agreeing in the FSC context on development of the standards uh, um, that, that the FSC oversees. Um, it is a challenging exercise. It takes tenacity, it takes a lot of energy and personal commitment by the individuals uh, representing the various organizations involved. Let me just uh, conclude by um, uh, correcting you, Glenn, on the FSC question. The, the Canadian Boreal Forest Agreement is really agnostic mm -hmm. to the um, various uh, competing certification schemes. Uh, however, um, we, we do have uh, six goals that we're working on, one of which is the question of forest practices. And we are trying to set uh, a world-leading um, standard for how we manage boreal ecosystems by developing advice for how to move to an ecosystem-based management approach that could work in concert with any of the certification regimes. And in that work, we recognize the FSC National Boreal Standard, which is one of the 
regional standards, speaking from a global perspective, uh, as the benchmark for the work that we're doing. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Aaron. I'd like to just stay with you for a moment. So the CBFA was launched with great fanfare about five years ago, and it was uh, a really unique piece, and as you say, like a, a, a global example of non-state actors trying to, find, trying to resolve a really wicked problem. Where are you today, five years on? I think some would say we haven't seen too much of you. Where, where, have, where has that work gone? I, I can understand we've talked about integrated land use planning. Integrated land use uh, planning is very, very difficult. What sort of successes have you had and what do you see for the future? Well, thank you, Glenn. Uh, yeah, we're, we are approaching five years of implementation of our agreement, uh, which was announced in the spring of 2010. Um, and, you know, as I indicated, it's a very ambitious undertaking across a range of goals from forest practices to establishing a network of protected areas for the boreal to managing forest species at risk with a particular focus on woodland caribou. Uh, addressing climate change, um, and, and ensuring uh, market recognition for all of this uh, activity. Doing this in a, um, a new approach, this collaborative approach that I spoke of, that sees uh, the conservation community and the forest industry move past that history of uh, adversarial engagement to a more collaborative one pursuing joint solutions. We've been very busy in that time frame, working uh, across the country. One of the first outcomes that uh, we managed to achieve is agreement on blueprints for how we're going to do some of our most difficult work, how we're going to plan for protected areas, how we're going to uh, address the challenge of planning for uh, caribou conservation uh, across uh, the country. We developed these blueprints with scientific input, input uh, from, directed by our independent panel of scientists who helped oversee our scientific work, with the engagement of many uh, academic institutions, and, and as well, the scientists in the Canadian Forest Service, amongst others, support, which we're very grateful for. But these two blueprints, scientifically grounded, our, our consensus blueprints that the signatories of the CBFA uh, came to ground on, a recipe for how we should do uh, what, it, what is our, our goals two and three of the CBFA. So they're very significant achievements in and of themselves, and they're available on our website. We've been busy implementing, developing recommendations pursuant to that guidance across the country. Um, we've been fortunate enough to provide input to what was called the Lower Athabasca Regional Planning Process in northeastern Alberta, where we were uh, influential in helping to establish two new wildland class parks in that region, uh, representing some 350,000 hectares. Uh, we were, um, in the spring of 2013, we announced our recommendations jointly for um, caribou range plan in northeastern Ontario, uh, north of us here in the Abitibi River Forest, a recommendation that sees uh, a caribou conservation zone uh, established and voluntarily respected by the forest companies there that creates a contiguous area of some 835,000 hectares. But at the same time, we did it in a smart manner that helped us actually improve wood supply availability uh, in that uh, landscape that uh, we've been working with the Ontario government towards the implementation of those recommendations, confirming that they meet the provincial guidelines. Uh, we've been engaged with the communities and the First Nations in that landscape. We, had, we enjoyed the support of the Northeastern Ontario Municipal Association and all the local communities when we announced those recommendations. I'm actually, um, happy to update that we've, it's come to our attention through the outreach work that we've, we've been doing that the Moose Cree, one of the First Nations in that planning area, has recently written to the Premier of Ontario uh, asking for the protection of the North French watershed, which is a, a, an 
overlaps very nicely with our recommendation, so we're, kind of, we're excited by that. Um, but uh, we also have other outcomes uh, across the country that we're, we are working on and contributing to. I'll mention one other. Uh, recent uh, developments on the island of Newfoundland. There, the provincial uh, government has put in place a new forest management strategy uh, that uh, institutionalizes much of the vision of the Canadian Boreal Forest Agreement, in my opinion. The CBFA signatories have been working away at a table there, and like many of our other tables, we've got provincial government at the table, we have uh, Canadian Forest Service representatives at the table, we have the two First Nations on the island of Newfoundland, and they've been working on a set of recommendations for our land use planning uh, vision. The province has announced a new forest management strategy. It's acknowledged the CBFA, and that new strategy lays out a uh, 10-year deferral of caribou habitat on the island of Newfoundland that represents some 5 million hectares, almost 50% of the island. But it's done in a very smart way that actually preserves wood supply opportunity and lays out a plan for a forest development strategy that seizes on some of the innovative opportunities that are emerging, something I'd like to get to, and, and uh, sets the province on a course for uh, a wonderful balance of conservation, the engagement of First Nations communities, and a vibrant future forest industry, um, which is, I hope, a type of outcome that we can replicate elsewhere uh, across Canada. So collaboration is difficult. Janet, the CBFA has come out of the most recent War in the Woods. Back in 1992, Canada offered to the world at the Rio Summit something called the International Model Forest, which is now a network of, uh, I think, 60-some forests in over 30 countries. Again, a model, a Canadian model, of landscape-level collaboration, much bigger than forests, just all the resource, all the users of the, of the resource. Is there something particular about Canada that these types of, of international examples would emerge from Canada? Your earlier question seemed to suggest that maybe we're better at talking about these things than doing them. Could you explore that a little bit and, and, and perhaps reference your experience in South America? So I'm not an expert on the Canadian model forests, but I do know that when I worked in Peru, for example, there was immense interest in, in the model forests, and it's something that some of, some of the, uh, my colleagues at Cartier in Costa Rica have carried forward mm -hmm. as well, and seen this as a, as a space in which, uh, particularly for local communities that do not have secure tenure to lands, can begin to, through, Canadian model, through that uh, model forest experience, begin to build a space in which that might happen. So I think that, um, that Canadian initiative has carried on on its own, even though even after um, sort of support from Canada has diminished or dwindled. Um, I think Canadian, uh, I didn't mean to imply that Canada just spoke and didn't, um, doesn't offer concrete examples of that the rest of the world can learn from. And back to what David started this morning with the war in the woods. And I think companies in Canada, um, forest companies, have had earlier than other, in, maybe in some other places, to have to um, engage with other constituency groups in being able to, in thinking of other forest values. And so what Canada did, for example, with the beginning of FSC, where uh, Forest Stewardship Council was launched in Canada in 1994, and I think in Montreal was to set up, at the same time with the other three chambers, social, economic, and environmental, Canada set up an, an Aboriginal chamber. So I think from its inception, Canada sh has shown that there is this possibility of beginning to not just have um, engagements at the judicial level and in the courts, or engagements at the level of blockades and you know, being played out in the press, which then creates a level of adversarial actions that are hard sometimes to pedal back from, but also in multi-stakeholder processes like having the Aboriginal Chamber. That, I think, because of Canada's example in that field, FSC International has set up a Permanent Indigenous Peoples Committee, PIPC, which uh, gathers together Indigenous peoples across the globe 
and then they th that have the year of the International Board of Directors. I think those are Canadian initiatives and, and which um, Canada maybe can take more credit for and which are I, um, really important. I think also Canada has, uh, like many parts of the world, comes out of a colonial experience and that experience therefore me resonates with third world countries or global south countries that also have to grapple with what that means for the way forests forest law has developed, forest policy has developed, who has access to land in the post-colonial period. And that shared history, I think Canada, um, the way it's tackled it's, uh, some, many of these issues, both offers lessons and then has, can learn from other processes elsewhere in terms of that. I mean, as I think this morning's panel mentioned, forestry is not an easy topic. It's a complicated field because you're dealing with different kinds of levels of jurisdiction, forest law, the regulations are complicated, and sometimes for the general public, it seems opaque. And so I think what Canada has done, because there are many constituency groups that demand um, access, they demand a voice, it begins to show a way in which you can unpick that complicated history and make it uh, uh, a space in which they can be sharing. So I, mean, I think it's hard to generalize because as everyone knows, uh, there are many different provincial jurisdictions with different approaches, but I think overall Canada has, has been forced to, and because of its constituencies, to tackle this, these problems maybe a bit earlier than other places. Now if we could go a little bit more deeply into your experience on, on Aboriginal forestry, and I, David, I don't think anybody's said Section 35 yet, but now, now they have. Um, <laughs> There's an awful lot going on on, uh, on First Nations rights and access to tenure. You're an expert in that area. What, what can you tell us about how that's evolving, perhaps in particular in British Columbia, uh, versus your experience in Guyana, Suriname? So I think globally there's, I mean, War in the Woods maybe uh, was a catalytic moment. But globally, I think through processes, judicial processes, and more general processes, they, um, everyone has, including forestry companies, beginning to have to pay or recognize that indigenous tenure, Aboriginal title, the, the, the intrinsic pre-existing rights of indigenous peoples to their land, are increasingly big, being given credence and recognition by governments or, and or internationally. And that's, uh, in the 21st century, that will just simply grow. That will not go away. I think as indigenous people say in Canada, we're still here. And so that uh, visibility on the landscape and visibility in processes um, is true in Canada and true elsewhere in many other parts of the world. I think internationally the engagement at the level of the United Nations, the 2007 um, Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, with some key concepts that came out of that, like free prior and informed consent, FPIC, um, are resonating increasingly across Canada and I think in other jurisdictions as well. And these processes or these, this kind of terminology isn't necessarily, um, I think, um, to be scared of. I think many forestry companies have engaged with them and found that it's become easier one, you know, with structured approaches than without them. So I think uh, globally, in terms of indigenous rights, there, I don't think I could make a, um, a generalization, and uh, not for Canada, not for elsewhere. But certainly the trend is, is for increasing First Nations, not just participation, but accommodation in these issues on traditional ancestral lands um, global, worldwide. And that wouldn't go away. OK, thank you. I know from um, the forest sector certainly likes to, uh, to um, point out, uh, and Mr. Morso had a had a statistic this morning, but that the forest sector kind of argues itself with, with mining as to who's the largest employer of uh, First Nations, but either we're either first or second. So a very significant employer uh, of First Nations. 
uh, the increasing access to tenure uh, right across the country is, is, is going to increase um, the need to engage. As I talk with uh, some of David's constituents in, uh, in British Columbia, I'm actually struck by how relaxed the private sector is compared to the government sector in terms of recent court rulings with regards to First Nations. I find that you know, uh, the members, the private sector members of the forest sector are in British Columbia are very comfortable and are, have a long history of working with First Nations and don't, if you will, seem to, uh, to concern that the whole world is going to shift as a result of some recent uh, legal rulings, but rather more, more of the same and, and, and they're ready to engage and, and have been doing that for some time. Now, Ben, I'd like to come back to the, is it California? Effect. Effect, yeah. yes. And uh, if you could explain that a little bit more. Sure. You know, it was an intriguing idea, the, you know, the idea that uh, you, you set a standard and then you raise it. Mm -hmm. I tend to think that that's what we get from the European Union on trade issues. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I, I, uh, I'd like to explore this, this idea. Yeah, the overall idea is not that one shouldn't have increasing standards that address environmental and social values. When That's fantastic. The issue is how do you think in a global economy how you might nurture various mechanisms uh, to do this. So the California effect notion is that through public policies that embrace markets in some way, you might get a ratcheting up of standards over time versus a ratcheting down. Uh, but the ratcheting up process means developing coalitions with businesses and social activists and NGOs around those uh, places in which the standards are low. Uh, so instead of always going higher and higher at the highest level in the world, you actually focus on those that are lower and bring them up. And that's a new way of thinking about creating coalitions that might be quite durable. So another problem beyond just the standards themselves is how durable they are. And just mentioned you're always changing your standards here in Canada. Uh, uh, now, if they're durable and they're going up and we're all underneath them in a level playing field, that's fantastic, right? But um, one of the things we find out is that it matters very much whether the uh, coalition of actors who are supporting the standards is broad-based, especially on market mechanisms. So if you end up creating higher standards that have no economic incentives for doing so, and that the market mechanism is the key instrument to try and increase the standards, you've got to disconnect between what you want to achieve and the actual mechanisms uh, for doing so. So the California effect is one way to think about how you might nurture that process using public and private efforts. And my point or argument or hypothesis was that when it comes to certification, we ought to spend as much time thinking about nurturing that kind of coalition building and implications for where the effects might occur. Now, this is in fact recognized now by the range of actors involved in certification systems. The FSC is well aware of this need to think about how do you maintain a market logic around these mechanisms. Um, and where your priorities are for achieving influence on the ground versus reinforcing existing practices. Um, I think the Boreal Standard in Canada is an example in the FSC of that kind of learning process that's taken, that's taken place. Um, my point is, I think the biggest impacts of forest certification are not in the places where it already occurs. In Canada, in Europe, for example, where most industrial companies are third-party certified. The biggest impacts will be somewhere else that have not yet got certified, once the real market demand is there for that kind, of, um, that kind of incentive. And that means nurturing these coalitions and doing things that are consistent with those coalitions versus um, accidentally or inadvertently undermining the coalitions that you need to maintain and Im improve impacts elsewhere. Thanks for that. Now, so if, if, a, if a market mechanism like a certification yep. badge tells the buyer something, right. That's the purpose of yep. it. But standards are variable around the world. So let's say uh, previously Russia, was, Russia has a very similar forest to Canada. Uh, if we take a certification, a similar certification FSC or, or some other one uh, in Canada and in Russia, does the buyer get the same guarantee? Can the buyer have the same confidence if this is a market-driven mechanism, if they buy wood from Russia or Cameroon or Canada? Right. So this is a really important question when it comes to assessing certification programs on the one hand, and then the public policies are often behind why groups would support them in the first place. 
So the FSC has tried to undertake a hybrid model in trying to develop global standards that have locally important input. So the actual specific standards that the FSC develops are developed through bottom-up stakeholder processes that Jeanette's talked about. And that means that in each country, and each subnational unit that the FSC identifies for creating those standards will be variable because you're actually involving bottom-up processes to do so. Now, they've got to conform to uh, global principles and criteria. They must. But the specifics will vary, um, and that does create challenges for this idea of standardization. Now, the FSC uh, competitors, if you will, the SFI, the PFC, the, the uh, CSA, give much more discretion for those standards to companies themselves than does the FSC. So you actually, when you talk about variation, the question is to what degree variation you're talking about. The FSC does have uniform variation on the levels of principles and criteria. They must apply globally. But in standards, it varies because of this bottom-up stakeholder process. So what I would say is there's a question about the standards always changing, as you in Canada always change your standards too. The public policies are always changing, not just certification. All standards are always changing. Let's just accept that. The question is, what is behind that effort? And in the case of certification systems, the issue is, can we use the marketplace as a way to generate those standards development processes? And can certification provide some kind of global effort that might actually improve practices on the ground? That requires first recognition of certification programs, customers and consumers knowing they exist, and then thinking about where are our biggest impacts of certification in the field. I would argue in Canada, Certification is really important for creating stakeholder processes. It's really important for uh, marginal on the ground imp impacts, um, but it can be transformative in other countries if we think more carefully about how the lessons from Canada through certification could get implemented in other countries around the world. I want to add one more point, though. Mm -hmm. If we think about market mechanisms uh, globally and what can Canada do to be part of this broader global dynamic, one of the big hurdles we face, as any forest company will know here, any retailer will know here, is supply chain tracking of forest products. These are incredibly complicated supply chains, so that by the time uh, an illegally harvested product from Indonesia or Cambodia gets to Home Depot, we don't know that that's legally harvested or not. So what's happened in the last few years is an emergence of an incredibly grand scale coalition of forest companies in both the north and the south, government agencies, environmental groups, aid agencies, focusing not on high standard certification programs, but on baseline legality verification programs. The idea is that you, just, you would just weed out of markets the worst products, those that are illegally harvested. The benefit of that approach, even though it's much more modest than certification, is that every legally harvesting firm has a self-interest in being part of this community because prices are being deflated by the illegal harvesters. So legally harvested companies are losing because they're competing with illegal harvesters. So ironically, by weeding out the worst players through a baseline process, you might get more impacts on the ground uh, immediately than the high standard certification programs where sometimes the cost of the compliance is so high, companies are, are balking. Okay? If this is true, and we think it is, then the biggest impact of focusing on baseline legality verification will be a self-interest on the part of companies and NGOs and governments to build supply chain tracking systems. Because as long as the costs of building tracking systems are lower then the benefits you get by weeding out the illegal material, because the price will go up, your coalition is quite large. And we think this transformative potential that's occurring in our midst right now is really important. But ironically, in this case, it means being careful not to increase the standards on legality verification so high that the coalition is undermined. Because the tracking systems that emerge from that could really benefit future impacts um, for thinking about global sustainable, for sustainable forest management. And Ben, on that, is there a role for governments or is this strictly a market-driven private sector enterprise? So this is a really important question. So we work a lot of the interaction of public and private authority. And we do think that, on, for example, in the case of land use planning uh, that the Boreal Forest Agreement has been so important on, government 
has to play an important role in that process. Now, if industry and NGOs can come together beforehand, as has happened in this case, that is a fantastic way to create this collaborative process that can create some durable results. But you couldn't rely solely on market mechanisms for the land use conservation challenges. They exist. Be, uh, you could never have enough market incentives to justify conserving. You do it because other values are also important. And this agreement, I think, is really showing the importance of that kind of process. But the market mechanisms could help tip the scales for these broader land use systems. So legality verification is not about saying to governments elsewhere, here's what you must do. It's saying, let us help you enforce the laws that you do have. Now, in our comparison of force regulations, we found that in some developing countries, they actually have on the books fairly strong prescriptive standards, but they're not enforced. So legality verification does not impose any challenges on sovereignty. It says, let's help you. So ironically, companies who are legally harvesting uh, in the global south, governments who want to enforce their laws, actually like this coalition because instead of imposing costs on them, it's helping them re realize their own public policy objectives, many of which on the books are actually looking pretty, pretty, pretty good. I don't want to overstate this, but the point is that this market mechanism is meant to actually reinforce government governance challenges by interacting public and private uh, uh, features in ways that we have not seen before. The important thing is to always think about how to maintain this coalition because the impacts, I think, could be very important, but we would hate to undermine it accidentally by taking it to be a certification system process, which is the high standard stuff. Mm -hmm. Right, thank you. Aaron, I'd like to bring you into this because it seems to me that one of the, um, one of the great strengths of the CBFA was this bringing together of historic combatants, the, the ENGOs and, and the industry, but perhaps one of the weaknesses was the absence of governments and First Nations. How has that evolved today? What are you doing about that? Um, thank you for the question. Uh, you know, it, it has been a significant challenge for the CBFA um, from our, the announcement of our agreement. We, uh, we saw as the signatories to the agreement that the, the peace treaty, if you would, between our formerly combatant um, uh, sectors uh, would be well received, and, and, and uh, we, le we learn as we go that uh, not, as, uh, not everyone was as enthusiastic about the announcement uh, as we were, um, and in part because we didn't have clarity around that. Uh, we set out in our agreement that it was our intention uh, to engage with governments, to recognize governments, including Aboriginal governments, as the, the landlord, if you will, uh, for, the, for the conversation that we're having um, and that we needed to engage with uh, government. Um, and we faced a lot of initial criticism and we took that and we have buckled down. And in the five years that we uh, uh, have come from that day, we have been trying to earn back uh, faith in those communities by engaging with them. And uh, I'm, you know, I'm happy to report we've made a lot of progress on that. We are engaged with governments across the country now, both uh, provincial governments, Aboriginal governments, and uh, particularly um, with your department, Glenn, I, I just want to acknowledge the support that the federal government provides to the CBFA, uh, which is, is vital. It's uh, both financial support, but also more importantly, the scientific and technical input of the significant science resources of the Canadian Forest Service who are providing advice, uh, joining us in uh, meetings, etc. So um, we've come a long way since we announced our agreement. Uh, we have a lot more to do on this front uh, to continue to earn the, the trust of uh, governments, including very particularly Aboriginal governments. Uh, but that's done really at the, at the table in the local um, planning areas that we're planning in where we're meeting with the First Nations whose traditional territories we're operating in and engaging with them uh, as part of the conversations that we're having. Uh, so I, in summary, I think we've come a long way on this front. Uh, we, we do have a lot more uh, uh, to do on it. 
Um, but at its core, we're trying to change the relationship between these two protagonists. Um, we're trying to transform ourselves from adversaries uh, to uh, collaborators, to working together to find joint solutions to bring forward and engage others. In. Mm -hmm. And uh, we I talked about some of the successes we've been having on that front. Uh, we've had challenges on that front. Uh, but there's a real enthusiasm inside the CBFA about the progress that we're making. And five years on, it's a voluntary initiative. We have many uh, parties fully committed, working very hard uh, towards those solutions. Thank you. Just a, a quick heads up. I think we've got a, just over 30 minutes left. So would welcome questions uh, any time from now in terms of uh, either online or here in the room. Um, while we give you some time to gather your thoughts, Janet, I'd like to, uh, I'd like to turn to you and, and, and ask you as a member of the, uh, of the FSC Policy and Standards Committee, um, what are your thoughts on the ongoing review of FSC standards and, and where that's going? So, the, um, that, that review, it's, it isn't so much a review as compliance with the need to adapt to the global principles and criteria that uh, Ben mentioned, which have been changed and, and revised in uh, 2012, January. So that's an ongoing process. Uh, the national standards will are, as Ben mentioned, have indicators. And so there's now under development and almost completed a set of what are called IGIs, International Generic Indicators, to help particularly maybe not Canada, but um, countries which have less resources or fewer resources, but they could use those IGIs in developing and crafting their own indicators of sustainability. And that's, um, I think that's ongoing. So those standards are, are being, many of them are, some of them are ready, like France, and a few of them are, are sort of slated this year to be revised. Um, if I may, I'd like to just uh, reflect a little bit on what Ben just said about legality verification versus full certification and the way in which uh, legality verification might allow progress and moving forward of the goals we all believe in, which would be uh, economic, social, and environmental sustainability. And I think certainly the big schemes we've seen, we, that we, um, I'm aware of, Lacey Act in the USA, uh, European Union Timber Regulations, the EU FLECT uh, regulation, uh, it isn't just, they're not just taking legality as what the national law says necessarily, but are looking as well at what other claims on legality are there in nation states. So that's, I think that's, that's all um, what uh, people who are interested in certification would be very, uh, would applaud. I think we can't lose sight of what was the impetus for certifi voluntary certification schemes in the first place. And that would be that it would uh, allow this uh, transparency across uh, um, different stakeholders and rights holders to be there and to have a robust appeals process and a dispute resolution process that, was that would be available outside of what the possibilities in a, in a judicial setting, in a government setting. And I think that's why that, those real pluses for certifi voluntary certification schemes, that it's transparent, that they're robust schemes, that you have a dispute resolution procedure, are the great value in moving beyond simply legality to uh, protecting ecosystem values, social values, and economic values. Yeah. Thank you. And uh, so Ben, I'm not gonna let you off the hook. Come back to that, yeah. uh, that question I had yeah. earlier about yeah. uh, how's Canada doing? Yeah. Well, I can hardly speak for Canada, I think, I think because uh, as Pierre in the first, the first um, uh, panel mentioned, each province has a different historical, uh, a different history and a different mm -hmm. approach to these complicated issues. Uh, in Canada, it's, um, many of these uh, battles have been fought in the courts. And that's always been a way, that's always had the effect, like, as you mentioned with the Silcotin decision of June 2014, 
wonderfully concentrates everyone's um, opinion when a, a big decision comes out that um, you know can't be ignored if it comes from the uh, it's the final Supreme Court of Canada's decision. You mentioned as well that companies in BC are uh, less uh, frightened or less worried about the implications of silk quoting than maybe the government is. And I think that's also um, reflective of economic players who have gone, you know, not waited for federal or provincial um, level uh, initiated discussions, but have gone out onto a landscape and figured out with uh, traditional um, peoples, what are our shared interests? How can we advance these and begin to uh, create an, uh, agreements, maybe more uh, um, not legally uh, binding, to allow them to operate in those, in, those, um, in those contexts? And I think that's where the experience of Canadian companies back to what was said by the first panel, I think needs more communication. Because forestry, again, I think it's complex, so we just never, we never see enough specialist communicators in the information sense that can tell these or share these best practice examples, which I think exist. But we are not good at, in forestry schools or in forestry departments and forestry companies at getting those messages out, I think. Thank you. We're perhaps dominated in the news by some of the other resource sectors. Ben, uh, back to you. Yep. Uh, perhaps a, a last question before we turn to the to the room. How, how in your sense, how is Canada doing? Um, so it is a great question, and there are a few ways to answer that. Um, as I mentioned before, in our study of uh, forest practices regulations, which is now um, needs to be updated. Um, because you always change the rules. But um, in general, on the level of forest practices, uh, when you look at the degree of prescriptive policies in place, things that companies must do on the ground, uh, the standards are, are relatively high compared to most jurisdictions. Now, whether they're high enough or whether they actually um, are appropriate, those are debates that all of you have in this room. But when you stand back and compare across jurisdictions, you see this result emerging. Uh, I think it's really interesting um, and speaks to then how we think about whether uh, and what role Canada can play in the, in the global uh, challenges uh, we face. Um, but let's just take the uh, uh, Canadian Boreal Forest Agreement as an example too, um, uh, and think even about land use questions in general. And I would argue that Canada has an extraordinary history over the last 25 years of bringing stakeholders together around creating durable land use allocation decisions. They look at both practices on the one hand but also protection, biodiversity conservation on the other hand, in ways that are quite extraordinary. I think perhaps New Zealand might be another example, but there aren't many in the world that have this kind of really focused uh, effort. Um, you know, I don't think Aaron mentioned this, but you know, and this, the CBFA is part of a process that I think in the last 12 years moved protection in the boreal forest from 8% to I think it's over 30% now. Um, and that kind of figure um, is extraordinary. I would ask you to tell me where else in the world you see that kind of, uh, that kind of uh, protection taking place. Um, why did that happen? It happened in part because of the coalition of actors who recognized, in part owing to markets campaigns globally, but also the need to link different values, that there was a need to get this story right. It could create actually some kind of business model for uncertainty, but also embrace certain values. And to me, that lesson for how Indonesia right now is addressing these questions, how Brazil is right now thinking of very similar approaches. These lessons for what Canada has learned, I think, can be nicely diffused uh, to those other, those other regions. So I, depending on your values and how you see how force ought to be managed, the answer to your question is different. But what I, can, what I can tell you is that on the forest policy side of things, the prescriptive levels, and on the land use allocation side of things, Canada is at the forefront of innovating with new ways of thinking that might create some durable solutions across different groups. If I may, let me just jump in, uh, Ben, and correct you there. Um, I absolutely agree that uh, the, there have been a series of processes going on across the boreal forests of our country that show a great deal of momentum right. towards solutions for the challenges yeah. of conservation and sustainable development. 
we're, right now we're at 10% in the strictly legal protected, um, uh, protected areas in the boreal forest. But tremendous momentum, um, both from provinces in terms of uh, initiatives that they have for boreal conservation and, and sustainable development, Quebec's Plan Nord, uh, Ontario's uh, Northern Plan, I could go on, uh, Alberta's yeah. Land Use Framework, et cetera. There's a lot of very uh, interesting leadership uh, going on to, to move that bar uh, forward. So it's not 30%. We should no, correct not. that. So where's that figure from then? Because there was this... Uh, figure a few years out there that when you add up all the voluntary efforts and the government protections that together it was about 30 uh, percent is that so this is one of the areas okay. where uh, good information is critical yeah. good data uh, very important yeah. uh, so yeah. in the strictly legal legally in protected it, sense right. uh, IUCN right. uh, categories one through four we're right. at 10.4 right. percent okay so, so yeah. is the 30 but because of the voluntary Agreements is that why, or what explains the higher number? Uh, there's a lot of okay. uh, contributors okay. to um, what you might okay. describe as conservation progress right. okay. outside of the protected areas front. Okay, that yeah. could be added up to a much more significant number. I, okay. I take, for instance, the commitment of the CBFA forestry company signatories right. to the deferral of caribou habitat right. that they made. Uh, to create room for the conversations that we're having about caribou planning. So they set aside 98% of caribou habitat, boreal woodland caribou right. habitat, on their tenures across Canada. Right. Very significant total right. area of almost 30 million hectares. Okay. Uh, but that's a temporary deferral intended to create space for conversation for solutions. And depending on how you count, obviously, this topic, you might include that and would significantly contribute to a larger number. Let me just add to that then too, because I think that it's a really good conversation then. So public protections versus various uh, voluntary agreements that might add up to a higher number. In um, Brazil right now, there's a moratorium in place on, on soy uh, that companies along the supply chain have agreed to as a way to stop deforestation owing to soy uh, crops. And the question is, how do you move from a moratorium, which you can count and add up, to a durable uh, solution. I think the question of the voluntary commitments that perhaps our broader figure was um, referring to might be a way to think about how you move from moratorias to permanent solutions too. Uh, absolutely. Well, I, I think yeah. to, um, to reap the benefit yeah. of some of those voluntary initiatives, we need right. to move to formalizing them in a right. way that they can be internationally celebrated. Yeah. Um, but there's a lot of, uh, as, as you're suggesting, there's a lot of that voluntary leadership going on, and, and uh, I actually hearken back to uh, Dr. Smith's comment earlier in the panel where she challenged, in fact, uh, the forest industry to help make some of that information more readily available so we can uh, analyze it. So. And if I may, I'm going to, this is a great conversation and I see people are lining up, can we say lining up? Uh, uh, to get into the conversation, and I know that there's some folks in the room that are experts in numbers and may wish to, uh, may wish to correct us, and I would just refer back to a point made in the earlier panel uh, that half of our forest, half of our boreal forest is, is what we consider non-managed non forest. And, you know, I'm going to go out on a scientific limb here, but functionally, that half of our forest functions very much mm -hmm. like a protected area very much in terms of ecosystem services. And so that's, that's nowhere in those official numbers. And we don't report that to the, to the UN or any, but, but functionally, those are, they're vast, vast areas that are effectively protected. And I have got a question number one there. If you could just identify yourself and... Sure, and yep, I'm Florence Devy from the Canadian Parks and Wilderness Society. And so I, I wanted to be able to say the word California effect. Um, <laughs> But it's, it's interesting, you mentioned the FSC and, and possibly the lost opportunity there. Yeah. Um, and it, it, it made me think about the sort of the balance that you need to have between interests. And, and it could be that um, for, for the people who are working on the FSC in Canada and who were working in BC at the time, you know, the balance of interest what wasn't quite there in terms of between, NG and I wasn't part of it, but between NGOs and businesses maybe right. um, in terms of being willing to, to say, okay, we're going to take a step back and we're taking this one for the broader global team, right? So it's like when you're talking about this, this coalition, 
you know, when you're when you're working on the ground and you're trying to change the situation in the place where you are, right. sometimes it's hard to say, okay, but legality is really important, so we're willing to take a step back for now and yeah. and say Canada is okay because right. because we want Indonesia to reform. So how do you see sort of those kinds of conversations happening and and either the forestry or NGOs being able to kind of have diverse roles, right? The the role of we wanting things to be the very best that they can be in Canada, yeah. and at the same time recognizing that in other parts of the world, you know, we could potentially bring people along by having a different strategy. Yep. Can I, can I answer? Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Okay, love that question. So my answer would be work backwards from what it is, what are your goals that you want to achieve on the ground? So what I'm trying to argue here is that the land use allocation approach is different from the practices side, and we shouldn't confuse them. And I would argue, again, a hypothesis, that on the forest practices side, um, using certification and uh, um, more modest legality verification has potential if we think about the logic for these coalitions of NGOs and firms. The problem has been that we've used forest certification as a proxy for the land use questions, which are much more difficult. They can be part of a broader agreement, but by themselves don't really do it very well. So here's the example I want to give you. The Forest Stewardship Council said, okay, we've got a problem with deforestation. We're going to offer practices solutions. How do we do the land use problem? Oh, I know what we'll do. We'll have a cutoff date of 1993. And we'll say any forests that were deforested before 93, okay, any, pl any plantations cannot um, be part of our system. Okay, so what this meant was that any deforestation that happened before 93, FS, companies love the FSC, they can get certified, it's fantastic, but those that after 93 couldn't get certified then went to, in the case of Indonesia, palm oil. Okay, because palm oil, why not go to palm oil since you can't get certified FSC? Okay, now palm oil is much more negatively impactful on the environment than our plant, forest plantations, than our natural forests. So what did happen in palm oil? Oh, well, the certification of palm oil. Okay, so they had a cutoff date given they have a problem too, the deforestation question. And they said, okay, 2006 is our cutoff date. Okay, so all the companies now between 93 and 2006 that were part of deforestation went for the palm oil certification. They're now the good guys. But the impact on land use was negative, ongoing deforestation. So my point is, when the land use side come together, like you did in, in CBFA, collaborate, discuss what do we want to achieve on the ground, and don't let the tail wag the dog and say, well, how can we use certification as part of this process in the working forest? Fantastic. But always have your goal on what is it you want to achieve. In British Columbia, the protections that accrued when they doubled from 6% to 12%, actually 13%, they overshot by a, by a percent, was not owing to certification. It was owing to comprehensive land use processes that involved all stakeholders around these overall goals that have been, by the way, very durable. But 25 years later, these are very durable solutions. My point is, find the prize and work backwards from that for what solution makes the most sense to address them. Thank you. We've got a question over here. I don't think the microphone is on. Or if you could just maybe get closer to it. Yeah, it's working. Hello. <laughs> yeah, that's better. Yeah, my name's <clears throat> Gerald Kootenay, Six Elements Sustainable Management. Uh, boreal standards can have a negative impact on the economic potential of traditional lands of some First Nations. If that takes place, what should regulatory bodies do? Ooh, interesting question. Janet, do you want to take a run at that? So you're saying boreal standards can have a negative impact on the economic prospects of First Nations? Right, right. So, Again, I, I can't speak for any First Nation, I, and, or, or, and I, but I, can, I see where your question is going. Uh, because increasingly, as uh, Andre mentioned this morning, there are increasing numbers of First Nations uh, who are themselves uh, uh, forest own, um, have forest businesses and are um, engaging in these processes in an, from an economic standpoint. Um, I think the idea of what, how boreal standards would affect them, and I know in Canada, for example, that there are First Nations who have an adversarial uh, relationship or are, are wary of environmental NGOs. Um, I think these are now in, we're in the beginning stages of seeing them uh, evolve and play out and 
figuring out how, how in fact they might be uh, both participation and accommodation to that. Um, I think I would say that whether it's Canada or somewhere else where these issues are arising, the underlying, and I, this is what I would add to what, what Ben said in terms of thinking of what are solutions, are we too prescriptive, are we too discretionary? What I think First Nations and Indigenous peoples have really um, forced the rest of all other, other populations to be aware of is are these ideals of reciprocity, of a kind of moral geography in, in approaching their landscapes, their territories, that we need, we've all benefited from in the 21st century and we will continue to benefit from. So that beyond the bottom line of making your business work, how it works, you know, what value are we bringing all, are we taking account of all values, whether it's caribou and moose, non-timber forest products, spiritual places, that First Nations themselves and their companies are, have to grapple with. I mean, I know Mystic Management, for example, out in uh, Saskatch, Saskatchewan, um, had, was blockaded by some of the, the First Nations. So they have had to respond as well to their own constituencies in terms of how are we going to balance this kind of economic bottom line with the other values that we hold important and we hold, that we, we, we treasure. So this is a good landscape or a good territory, I think, for First Nations and non-First Nations peoples to begin to think in the 21st century, and we are interested in resilience. We're interested in how climate change is going to affect us all. How do this kind of moral geography help us all to advance in a way that can be reconciled the various interests? I'll add to that if I can. Um, I, I think it reinforces the critical importance of land use planning and engagement of communities in land use planning. Mm. Uh, you know, uh, we need to find solutions that are going to work uh, for First Nations communities, and the only way that's going to happen is by a dialogue and engagement. Uh, and mm -hmm. I'll, I'll give you an example of, uh, I mentioned our recommendations that the CBFA has put forward for Northeast Ontario. And uh, there, in, in close consultation with the uh, community whose traditional territory is right at the heart of where our conservation recommendations are, we carved out a First Nations economic development area uh, collectively. And so we came to a solution with the community, uh, the forest companies in question, the environmental groups and the municipalities that uh, ensured that the caribou conservation measures that we recommended uh, created room for the economic opportunity and the aspirations that that, that particular community had uh, for the lands in their traditional territory. Okay, I have got folks lining up. We'll go to that microphone. Hi, so this is a question uh, in from the web again, and it comes from Sten Nilsson based in Sweden. Uh, he says, with regards to certification, one side of the coin is having solid standards and large areas certified according to these standards. The other side of the coin is what's really happening on the ground and with the sustainability. Based on what I have seen, not only in Canada, but also in other parts of the world, the impact of certification on the sustainability on the ground has not been that great. Then he goes on to ask, why do you think that is? And do we have a system failure? Thanks. OK, who wants to take that on? Um, I mean, I could start by saying, when we first researched certification. I do. I want to take that on. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Go ahead, Ben. OK. When we first researched certification systems globally, one of our first cases was Sweden. Uh, and it's an important question because the uh, uh, industrial forest companies in Sweden eventually went for the Forest Stewardship Council. But the private forest owners who make up half the land base felt excluded from the process for a couple of reasons that are too detailed to go into, but they didn't feel that their concerns were being adhered to and they left the process. And they uh, helped create the program for the endorsement of forest certification, which now the CSA and SFI are housed under. So it isn't just a question of NGOs and First Nations and how they get involved in the process, but also how you engage the small forest owners. In this case, it was a very important question that wasn't well tended to, many would argue, and led to this uh, proliferation of, of systems. 
Uh, impacts on the ground, again, that goes back to the issue, what are you talking about? Are you trying to maintain existing standards that appear to be relatively um, appropriate um, and influence elsewhere in the world? Or are you trying to actually impact in Sweden itself? And this is also a debate that was really important. Mm -hmm. Do either of the other panelists want to jump in or? Well, I, I think, um, yes, globally we know that all of our, most of our ecosystems are depressingly being degraded rather than, rather, rather than uh, improved and the drivers for that degradation go beyond, you know, beyond what small certification schemes are going to be able to impact. I think the value of voluntary certification schemes um, across the world is that they are venues for learning. So that that idea of whether government learns from them, other stakeholders learn from them and maybe see what works there and how that can be expanded outside of the years that are certified is just a useful, a useful benchmark to have. Okay, thank you. So we have about 10 minutes left, so I'm gonna try and fit in as much as we can, so I'm gonna ask everybody to be, to be tight and brief, both the questions and, and, the, and the responses over at this microphone. Hi, Suzanne Nash from the Canadian Forest Service. My question is related to the CBFA. There have been two very significant signatories to the agreement that have pulled, um, particularly on the environmental side. I don't think there's more name recognition in Greenpeace. What, hi what impact has that had and what lessons have been learned and, and uh, is there a possibility of others pulling as a result or just want to hear your thoughts on that. Uh, thank you, Susan. Yes, no, I mean, Amongst the challenges we've faced is the departure from our agreement of uh, Greenpeace and Canopy. Um, and they left the, the agreement in the spring of 2013. Um, they cited uh, their frustration with the slow progress of implementation, uh, amongst other things. Um, and I think that's a concern that all of the CBFA signatories had. Uh, we certainly created great expectations with our announcement and uh, um, it's been a very challenging undertaking. Uh, and uh, so we share their frustration in that regard. Uh, but we have buckled down in their departure and we've, uh, we've kept uh, forging ahead. We, we refocused our work plan uh, as a result of their departure and we've been looking to try to build success, some of which I've spoken to uh, uh, in the wake of their departure. So um, an unfortunate development uh, but part of the challenges that uh, we've been facing. Yeah. Hey, thank you. We'll go over to this microphone. Um, Kathy Abusa with the Sustainable Forestry Initiative. I just wanted, can I just have a comment instead of a question, Glenn? Thank you. Um, I, I really think it's interesting because I have these conversations often on a global s stage and yet it's interesting when you're trying to have this conversation in Canada because, as Stan had said, globally only 10% of the world's forests are certified, yet in Canada all of the working forests are certified with the exception of small woodlot owners. Um, and so globally, we're seeing um, people trying to address a different issue. They've only got maybe 25% of global roundwood supply coming from certified forests, yet we have a huge threat of illegal logging globally. And therefore, you are seeing the Lacey Act and the EUTR being developed and legality verification measures being developed because globally you don't have widespread certification. And so in Canada, when you're asking, you know, Glenn, how's Canada doing? Well, we're doing great. We're, we're not high risk of illegal logging. We have the highest rate of certified forest land in the world. And, and yet, um, Obviously, as Canadians, on a public land base, we believe that we can do things better. And I think that's why you do have um, this tension between it's a global marketplace and global trade where Canada should be recognized and given access given its global leadership, but we are Canadian and we feel we can always do better um, despite strong forest policy requirements, which Ben has already remarked. And so that's why you end up having groups that are trying to change things and are trying to do things better, which is what the intent of the CBFA was, was essentially trying to get at. We have to figure out, as Canadians, how do we do that? It's a public land base, right? That's, that's the big difference here as well. And so you do need those responsible for public policy engaged in that sort of decision-making process. And I'm just so thrilled, you know, to hear that CBFA 
and, and others, as they come to understand, you need to have that public conversation about these issues, that it can't, it, it can't happen just on you know, more private conversations um, because it does undermine global competitiveness. And yet I'm really you know, pleased to see the change that I'm noting anyhow with the intentions of the CBA, uh, CBFA in trying to move things forward. Finally, I do want to comment on one comment that Ben made about the problem is, is with forest certification, it ends up being a proxy for land use decisions. That's true for FSC, it's not true for SFI. It's true for FSC because they operate in a global context. SFI operates in a context where there's robust legal requirements in Canada and the US. So we abide by that legal context, that public policy context, and then we layer on top of it. So there are some distinctions to understand about the standards and how we work, but I think we're getting in a better direction, but we do need to communicate more effectively our successes and we need to work together collaboratively on outstanding issues so they don't undermine global competitiveness. Thank you. Thank you. And in the interest of time, I'm going to uh, try to get both of these uh, two questions in. So. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Uh, my name is Bill Mernigan. I'm the Director of Research at Unifor. We have about 30,000 members in the forestry sector across the country and I found this morning's discussions to be fabulous and very enlightening and interesting. Um, and particularly this panel, we've been speaking about uh, uh, multi-stakeholder processes, NGOs, non-market actors, and so on. Uh, and, uh, and I'd like to ask of the panel, you know, uh, where obviously it's the livelihoods of forestry workers that is one of the key economic yeah. drivers and outcomes of public policy in Canada. We are in a very uh, difficult situation at times. We have a strong track record, I believe, in labor of partnering with the industry to move forward in its transformation, but also partnering with social justice movements uh, environmental movements and others. And I'm wondering uh, from a global perspective, if you can offer some insights on best practices or thoughts on uh, the constructive role that labor can play in this dialogue. Okay, Ben, do you wanna start or Janet? We try to be, try to be brief. So yeah. I, you go ahead, yeah. So <clears throat> again, that's a conversation that uh, you know, workers' rights, those issues, employment, what happens to mill towns when ownership is maybe a transnational company based in Washington DC or somewhere in the US and it, they close, they're able to close down because for example in British Columbia, the tenures are no longer tied to appurtenances. Uh, I think that level of conversation over what happens with, I think globally where labor rights have become perhaps more insecure is one where government comes in and where there's that, again, the need to, or they really need to think about what are our common Canadian values and what do we want to see in terms of companies that really have treated tenure as almost a private license. They're tradable, they can be uh, sold on, they are long term, they haven't been taken back. What happens when you, there's a, a landscape on which there are company, uh, town, uh, communities that have their the carpet pulled from under them? or you know, more uh, wages, wages which have not kept up with inflation to think about. I think those are broader issues of social policy and important for government to uh, step in and help to mediate. As the as they government as the ultimate uh, grantor of tenure. Um, just I guess a quick answer since it's a great question that needs a whole seminar attached to it. You know, I would say if you look back the last 25 years in Canada, um, there's been a shift a little bit from organizations promoting their own organizational interests, be it livelihoods, indigenous rights, biodiversity conservation, and so on, to thinking about our collective interests that we tend to share when we stand back a bit more. What do we want to do when we all turn 80 years old and look back on our careers? We all want to think about making sure species aren't rendered extinct by our activities. We want to think about First Nations livelihoods as being fundamental and producing some kind of livelihood uh, from the forest that can actually sustain um, our economy. And to me, we've had more focus on those collective interests through these often painful, but then very interestingly, very innovative ideas about moving forward that I think lead to, the, lead to a broader learning that Janet mentioned that I think does hold real promise for thinking about how to diffuse that model in Brazil, in Indonesia, and other places in the world. And I, I would just add that it, you know, this panel this morning hasn't really focused on the economics of the industry. 
uh, but there's a powerful story there. Right. And the last eight years has really been a perfect storm. And there has been, in a negative way, and there's, there's been about 130,000 job losses in this sector in Canada. And certainly there's parts of Canada like Northern Ontario where it's 50% of the jobs have disappeared. And uh, as we've seen recently, closures may not yet be finished. Right. So it's a very, very important part of the story. Uh, and so apologize if we didn't spend more time on that today. That's great. Thank you. This microphone. My name is Eric Calls. My company's Florcan. I'm a developer of Softwood. The United States uh, Softwood Agreement is about to come to an end. Okay. And the U.S. is seeking to renegotiate the treaty. Okay. Lobbyists and policymakers in the U.S. want to radically change the old agreement. What direction do you see the agreement actually going? All right, Aaron. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I guess that's, that's, that's for me. And um, you know, this is where I turn to my colleagues from the Department of Foreign Affairs, who are the lead on this file. Uh, Natural Resources Canada Canadian Forest Service provides technical support to foreign affairs mm -hmm. on this. On this. Uh, I, I, would, I would really just have to repeat the... Um, the, I think, fairly well-known facts, which, which are that uh, the Canadian industry, broadly speaking, the Canadian provinces, broadly speaking, are all of the view that the SLA should be renewed on its current terms, rolled over, if you will. For its part, the United States has not um, provided a view. They have not stated a negotiating position. And that's a concern. That's a concern for us. And uh, beyond that, I don't think I can really say anything. Uh, thank you. I used to study this very intensively in the 1990s, this, uh, this Canada-U.S. software lumber trade dispute. And uh, then I moved to certification, and that was a lot easier. Okay? <laughs> the uh, the software lumber trade dispute, and I did the first three uh, rounds, uh, is, is like the Middle East without the violence. It's just absolutely a tough one. It always, it's going to come back again and again because of the way U.S. trade law is structured. The protectionist interests always went out. Um, in this, the way the, the logics of uh, trade law work. Uh, so the consumer in the United States does not have the kind of influence you would need to have to create a different kind of outcome. So you're gonna have technical solutions, temporary um, solutions and so on, but the overall logic is not gonna change. And, and unfortunately, that's the kind of nature of the game that Canada's uh, dealing with right now. What you can do though, it used to be they would talk about Canadian forest practices, environmental practices being worse uh, than, um, uh, than in the United States. And they use that as another argument in Congress. And I think that one's um, no longer that salient for all the reasons we talked about today. I'll jump in and just yeah. add a little interesting fact. Yeah. It's not entirely unlike the Middle East. And we, you know, if you think about the softwood lumber agreement and the trade dispute that uh, it represents, it right. goes way back, uh, right yeah. to the Aroostock Lumber War on right. the border of... Uh, uh, Maine and New Brunswick, so right. uh, it too has Correct. been a very fractious debate, and right. let's hope that there's some collaborative solution to extend the current agreement. Right. So we're pushing right up against our limits. I think I'm going to ask each of the panelists in 45 seconds or so to just kind of get, get, uh, give us a, a wrap-up comment. So um, start on the left. I mean, all I would say is I tried to make this into a seminar because I think too often we just sort of reinforced our, our current approaches and our current organizational identities. When in fact, sometimes innovation occurs when we sort of stand back and just ponder where our own selves and organizations as part of a broader process. And I think this kind of forum is good for creating those insights. Though so thinking more in a more free way about how do we actually, in, as Canadians, but also as global citizens, think about the important problems facing our planet. And so I think ultimately, whatever you guys think about doing, in, collectively or individually, think about the actual problems you want to actually address and then link back to the solutions based on some kind of logic that that might actually address the problem. Thank you, Jenna. So um, this morning, uh, first panel, I think Pierre said that you can have great data, you can have satellite, LIDAR, but eventually it comes down to the boots on the ground. In your 400 meter squared patch, what's happening to your forest? So I think whether it's Canada or globally, there are, you know, we have to think of solution, ways of getting monitoring and engagement with what happens on the ground in our forests that involves indigenous peoples and local communities. I mean, we're not going to get foresters who get trained at forestry schools 
spend an increasing amount of time behind their computer screens. They're not out in the forest enough. So we can't wait, I think, as global societies for professional uh, monitors, but in Canada and elsewhere, how can we have creative ways of engaging with people who have a, a shared interest in that landscape and in uh, being part of the decisions that are made by it that maybe are less formal or not, not as prescriptive as Ben says, but allow that discretion and that uh, uh, space for uh, policy processes to move forward. Thank you. Well, uh, Glenn, I appreciated the opportunity to talk a little bit about the CBFA, but I actually think our great regret is that we didn't tackle the issue that you hinted at just a moment ago, which is the, you know, the economic future of, uh, mm. of the industry. And I just want to, in concluding comments, say you know, we're at a very transformative moment uh, for the industry where there's a tremendous opportunity for uh, the forest industry to engage in the bioeconomy, uh, a global marketplace where there's just a whole range of incredibly innovative products that offer a new future, a more sustainable uh, future for this industry that has come through some very, very difficult times. Um, and you know, when we think about the question of uh, the future of forestry, I certainly hope that it is one that's filled with significant value added bio products that are helping to displace more toxic and more challenging products and, and really creating a niche uh, for a more stable industry for the communities that rely on it and, uh, uh, and for uh, uh, the employees, uh, the union members, et cetera. So. Okay, well thank you very much and uh, to all of our panelists and thank you all of you for being here and participating in the conversation and a big thank you to the Public Policy Forum for, uh, for hosting and, and facilitating this, uh, this workshop today. And uh, like you, I look forward to lunch and listening to Anne uh, talk. So, thank you. Thanks, Thanks to the panel, ladies and and efficiency. So, ladies and gentlemen, it is a really a, a genuine pleasure for me to be introducing our guest speaker for this session. Um, before I do so, let me just uh, say thank you to our two discussion uh, panels this morning and to the moderators for each of the sessions. They were very rich discussions, lots of room for follow-up as well, I think. Uh, we've certainly been uh, enjoying taking uh, note of some of the themes that have been discussed. Uh, to cap today's session, we're really pleased that the former, recently former CEO of one of the world's largest forest products companies, Weyerhaeuser, has agreed to join us today. I'm referring, of course, to Anne Giardini. And, um, and we're really uh, sincerely delighted that you were able to make time in your schedule to join us for the session. The fact that you sat in on the morning's discussion um, as well and were able to see um, a diverse, engaged group of people on a theme that I know is dear and near to your heart as well. Um, Anne is currently the Chancellor of Simon Fraser University, which is a nice connection for me as a, I'm an alumnus of SFU. And um, she's recently taken on that responsibility um, in a very busy life that includes not only her recent, uh, recently completed leadership role at Weyerhaeuser, uh, but also um, now chancellor of a university, which is a job that's harder than it looks, I can tell you, uh, because it's a very, very busy position. Um, Anne uh, has been recognized for her many and diverse accomplishments and a very extraordinary career to date. Uh, Vancouver Magazine uh, noted her as one of the Vancouver Power 50. Uh, the WXN um, Network noted her as one of Canada's most powerful women. Um, 
She was named in 2011, going back just a few years, one of Canada's 25 most influential lawyers. Uh, in 2013, she received the Queen Elizabeth II Diamond Jubilee Medal. Uh, in addition to her extraordinary business career, she's also a writer, an author. She's a former columnist for uh, the National Post newspaper, but significantly, she's written two novels, and uh, she's just told me today that she has a new book that's going to be coming up uh, when she meets her deadline in the very near future this spring. So we're cheering for her, and we, it's another reason why we're delighted she took time out of her schedule to be with us. Please welcome, ladies and gentlemen, Angie Ardini. Thank you. Uh, I'll just start by saying that when I heard the news I was going to be named as Candace, one of Canada's most powerful women, I phoned my husband who works in Toronto. I said, honey, guess what? I'm going to be one of Canada's 100 most powerful women. And he said, long pause. And he said, and let's face it, you're not even the most powerful woman in our house. And if you knew my 20-year-old daughter, you would agree with that. That was a, a sobering thought. That's either, that means we've either raised her really well or really badly. I'm not quite sure which. Uh, so anyway, I'm going to start uh, with an imaginary piece of paper and a bit of imaginary drawing. And this is an exercise that I've adopted from the issues mediator and a fellow Icelander, Glenn Sigurdsson, who some of you may have known or encountered in your careers. Uh, like me, Glenn has spent much of his professional life working in, as he puts it, in the space where big problems meet big organizations. In my case, I like to think that I was usually the big organization, not the big problem. Anyway, here he says, interests, values, and power collide around difficult decisions and complicated disputes. Communities, companies, departments, ministries, civil society groups, First Nations, local governments, unlikely as it can seem, these groups are all interconnected in one way or another to certain problems and because of the problems connected to each other. This is Glenn's statement of where we find ourselves. What I've learned through hard experience is that the real problem is not usually the ostensible problem. The implications and uncertainties around fish, mines, gas fields, forests, are challenging in and of themselves. However, the far greater challenge is the inability of organizations to resolve problems when the solution requires engaging with other parties who see the world differently. I'm going to repeat that last bit. The far greater challenge is the inability of organizations to resolve problems when the solution requires engaging with other parties who see the world differently. So here's a bit of drawing that I want you to imagine. First, uh, I would draw a few circles in a cluster and ask you what you see. And people, interestingly, tend to say the same things, apples or oranges or berries, that's something like that. And then draw a circle around those discrete circles and again ask what you see. And people all tend to say pizza. I don't know why that is. We think about our stomachs. doesn't matter what we think about our stomachs. Uh, but in this case, and this is the drawing that we would draw on, uh, each of those circles is meant to represent an organization, such as a corporation or a government or agency or department or an indigenous community or a union or the media or a university or a city or a neighborhood, something like that. And the bigger circle drawn around them is the project or undertaking that brings or tries to bring them together. And we've all spent a lot of time in our careers working out which circle we are inside of and what we can influence from inside that circle. That requires knowing the, the decision makers, the levers and the systems, checks and balances inside where we operate. Many of us have had the experience, certainly I have, of getting too far in front of our own organization within our own circle. Um, we're sort of deke out of the borders a little bit and then we get pulled back in. Um, so uh, working within an organization also requires knowing what resources are available to us. For example, I used to wonder, I spent a lot of my career meeting uh, with First Nations um, uh, all over Canada, primarily on the BC coast, uh, and when, often when I met with their people, negotiators, uh, they often seemed uh, mad, even angry, 
Uh, and I like to think of myself as a reasonable and even likable person, and anger seemed a little harsh. Uh, and then one day it dawned on me when I went into these discussions uh, that I had in my briefcase or in the back office all kinds of resources. I had uh, telephones and budgets and workers and fax machines, um, a travel budget, a well-stocked library, lawyers and accountants and foresters and experts of all kinds. Um, and my friends at the band or council office had... Uh, pretty much what they had was anger. <laughs> they were pissed off. And that was the one tool in their toolbox. Uh, and uh, there's a saying that I like, uh, it's tempting if the only tool you have is a hammer to treat everything as a nail. Uh, and the flip side of that is if all you have is a hammer, you better treat everything as a nail because otherwise you won't get anything done. For the groups I was meeting with, and I'm sure some of you have had this experience, anger was their hammer and I was the nail. And moreover, the blunt traits treatment tended to work for them. Um, I am a Canadian after all, and faced with anger, I try to diffuse it, as many of us do, which leads to change on my part. And that, so that makes that a pretty useful hammer. And once I understood this, I found I minded being the nail a lot less. I had my toolbox and they had theirs. Being in our circle, implies that finding common ground means we spend a lot of time defining our boundaries and then trying to find or create areas of overlap. So if we could cut out those circles and slide them around on a table, we could do exactly that, overlay our circles in part to show physically the areas where we agree and can work together. As we've mentioned, someone mentioned uh, that the, uh, if you look at the circles of forest standards in Canada, however, the circumstances and settings are not static. They tend to change. The definitions change. The project changes. And so these areas of overlap slip and slide. The circles are in movement. We are bounded, but our areas of overlap are both limited and shifting. So there's something that this all doesn't get at. So we have our big piece of paper. We have our our discrete circles, we have the bigger circle, we've cut them out, we've moved them around. Um, and so what's left? We've left, um, if we look, ignore the circles on the table now, we look back at our piece of paper. It has, um, it now shows us the areas in between the circles. As people who help to resolve issues, our job is to understand the big and little things that happen inside not only our space and the other guy's space, but also outside the area covered by the others we deal with. And it's that everything else that interests me today, this ocean of the other. It's a fertile area in my view, and spending time there helps communication and understanding grow. This is what Glenn Sigurdsson means, I think, when he talks about the real problem not usually being the ostensible problem. The real problem lies in the unbounded open space, and often do the, so do the solutions. <clears throat> Each of us will perceive this area differently. For me, the other includes topics such as global warming, species loss, consumer demands, water shortages, the interests of future generations, literature and art, important thoughts, politics, economics, media, and so on. These are issues and concepts that don't necessarily have a spokesperson at the table. If I can sum them up, I would call this the area of authenticity, where, area, where issues are not bound up in defined interests and are not narrowly defined or static. You can call this different names. I like into the space between us, but um, uh, quilt making would work as well as a concept, the art of making something useful or beautiful out of many different parts. So this leads me into one of the flaws of what we often talk about. Uh, one concept I, I find myself talking more and more about now that I have a, a step, a foot in mining, is the concept of shared value, which is a term of art used particularly in mining, uh, but also of interest to us in forestry. As a reminder, because most of you know, the theories of the principle of shared value hold that companies should take the lead in binding business to societal needs. They do this by ensuring that societal issues are at the core, not the periphery, not on the margin of what we do, but at the center. 
the result ought to be the creation of economic value in a way that also creates social value because society's needs and challenges are being addressed. At the same time, the theory goes, the company's shared value policies and operating practices will enhance its competitiveness. competitiveness. The theory has friends in many places. For businesses, one advantage of shared value is that it recognizes that economic enterprises are very powerful, and businesses like very much to be thought of as powerful. Social enterprises like the idea that their values are going to be embedded in how business operates. They particularly feel good if they believe they have persuaded others to adopt their values. It isn't as much fun when they say they share their values at the start. You want to be able to see them come over to your side. And this can work well. It has worked well for some of those issues that are in the area in between, such as safety uh, and many aspects of the environment. And for something as basic, for example, as child labor. No one wants to go back to the Dickensian practices when stunted children routinely lost limbs and life in what the poet William Blake famously referred to as the dark satanic mills of his time. We now know that it is possible for well-run enterprises to comply with laws and social norms on these issues and still manage to return healthy profits for their shareholders, particularly, and this is important, and we've talked about this a bit this morning, if all are held to more or less the same standard. But the call now is for us to go much further, to resist uh, extraction, reduced, reduce consumption, and build alternative institutions. What happens when companies venture into areas of shared value beyond the motherhood issues of safety and direct environmental effects? into, say, how the business itself will be run, who makes the strategic decisions, who will benefit from its profits, and who will underwrite its losses. This discussion lies in what I've called the space between us. Throughout my career, I found myself, at least partly, at least some of the time, in that space between the circles. It would be easy to imagine that as a corporate lawyer and then an executive and president, I lived solidly and entirely within my circle, and to a certain extent I did. But as a writer, and as a woman in a largely male industry, and without a structured background in resource management, and with a novelist's bent for creative narrative, I've always had something of an outsider approach. Imagination is particularly important because we have only our own limited experiences to draw on, but need to be able to imagine what others perceive and experience and have a good idea of what their reactions will be to our decisions and our actions. We can and should take this even further if possible and imagine futures outside our own experience and the experiences of others. I sometimes wonder, for example, if people who read a lot of science fiction might make better decisions than the rest of us because they've already contemplated the future in this way. Certainly, I believe that people who read novels or who know their classics or the ancient myths and sagas, our First Nations stories and traditions, are better at the kinds of empathy and understanding that lead to better decisions. And I've got to I'll go back to quilt makers. I think that they have insights that we don't draw on very often, making a coherent whole out of small pieces. Our Canadian companies, in fact, applying shared value concepts in innovative ways in order to solve social and economic challenges while also creating a benefit for their businesses? Are we creating new opportunities for cross sector partnering? Uh, I think we are, and that's why we find ourselves here today. Now here's just a few examples from my own career of working towards shared value, more or less chronologically. Establishing a natural gas partnership at Six Nations uh, Indian Reserve in 2001. This enterprise was the winner of the second annual Ontario Aboriginal Partnerships Recognition Award. Participating in BC's province-wide land use planning processes through the 1990s and into the 2000s. This was a process, many of us are familiar with it, in which community members, stakeholders, and government representatives met around planning tables across much of the promise to work out strategic land use plans that now cover much of British Columbia. The plans determined which lands would be protected, resource management zones, and area objectives. 
a biodiversity strategy provided landscape level planning for biodiversity values. Setting up and helping to run and manage a number of joint ventures with First Nations, including ESOC Forest Resources, an innovative, ecologically sensitive forest management company in Clayoquot Sound and New Chalmers Traditional Territory, that produces western red cedar, yellow cedar, hemlock, Sitka spruce, balsam fir, Douglas fir, red alder, harvested to guidelines set out by the Clayoquot Sound Science Panel. Establishing the Wapawika Lumber Limited Sawmill near Prince Albert, Saskatchewan, a $22.5 million joint venture between Weyerhaeuser and Lac La Ronge Indian Band, Montreal Lake Cree Nation, and Peter Ballantyne Cree Nation. Supporting Wabagoon First Nations tree nursery and silviculture operations here in Ontario over a number of years. Between 1999 and 2005, finding ways to carry on the harvesting of trees on Haida Gwaii with the understanding and the participation, if not exactly the full support, of the Haida First Nation. In 2010, joining with several First Nations, the Government of Ontario and other forest companies and contractors in signing a historic shareholder-managed sustainable forest license covering the Kenora Forest. Under that cooperative sustainable forest license, First Nations and industry shareholders took over management of forestry operations on a 1.2 million hectare Kenora forest through a limited partnership. So this was putting everyone that had a stake in that forest as an owner of that license and at the table. Uh, signing with Weyerhaeuser on as a participant in the Canadian Boreal Forest Agreement, covering Canada's Boreal Forest to protect one of the largest and most ecologically significant ecosystems on the planet, uh, integrating economic and environmental values to ensure a sustainable forest future in the, in the Boreal Forest, the natural habitat, our forestry industry, and those whose industries rely on it entering into dozens of agreements with Aboriginal groups to support businesses, cultural and other relationships, and striving, but not yet having found a way to engage meaningfully with Grassy Narrows First Nation again here in Ontario. That's a partial list. So what have I learned from all of that? Looking back, taking a bigger picture. Most of it is quite humbling. Like many of you, I expect, I feel less certain, less earnest, less and less sure of the way forward today than I did 30 or 20 or even 10 years ago. This is partly because I know more now about what I don't know. These are Donald Rumsfeld's famous unknown unknowns, which is actually a remarkably useful and vigorous concept. He doesn't get full credit for that. It's also because I have seen more and learned more about the complexity and range of human responses to needs, wants, and threats. And it's also because, uh, as each of us carries on a career like the one I have chosen, we are likely to turn our skills to greater challenges. It's also because in an area of limits on resources, the challenges are genuinely harder. We can't just go out and deliver and discover a new continent and start over. We're unlikely to find new unknown sources of clean water, oil, gas, and so forth. This means the advantages our economies in the West have had over so many um, uh, developing, so-called developing economies are shrinking. They aren't only catching up. We are having to share, and this has led to, to a change in the standard of living that we can expect. I often think of a comment that U.S. President Obama said in an interview with the American news show 60 Minutes. The interviewer asked him what he had found to be the most frustrating part of his job as President of the United States. Obama said with a sigh, the fact that you are often confronted with bad choices that flow from less than optimal decisions made a year ago, two years ago, five years ago when you weren't here. You'd love to unwind some of that decision-making and say, I wish I could have nipped this at the bud. A lot of times, he went on to say, when things land on my desk, it's a choice between bad and worse. And as someone pointed out to me, the only things that land on my desk are tough decisions, because if they were easy decisions, somebody down the food chains already made them. So the interviewer then asks him, how many decisions like that do you have to make a day? And he replies, I can't count them. That's a tough job. Although not at the scale, significance, or intensity of that job, each of us, 
as we advance in our organization or in our field, often us find ourselves, as we develop our skill set, making or helping to make tougher and tougher decisions and making them more often. Now, one of the objectives of this event is to build new pathways of dialogue between and across sectors and industries and road test possible solutions, such as certification, which came up a few times this morning. So I'd like to talk about some of those projects I mentioned earlier, looking at the concept of shared solutions or shared values or shared understandings. So participating in BC's province-wide land use planning process, I personally would give this a solid 60%. Some might award it less. The process has been criticized for not involving sufficient First Nations input, for limiting how much land was protected, for failing to consider climate change in identifying management objectives, having too much defined as out of scope and too many exceptions, failing to coordinate decision making and failing to consider adequately cumulative effects. What about setting up and helping to run ESOC forest resources in Clayoquot Sound? Again, maybe 60%. ESOC has struggled to maintain itself against market forces and in light of its distance to markets. It's encountered what many of us have. Not enough consumers are willing to pay more for commodity products to support other values, such as First Nations economic advancement. What about Wapawika Lumber Limited near Prince Albert? I'd certainly give that less than 50%. Wapawika fell victim to the sustained industry downturn uh, and a need for funding, critical funding, that turned out not to be available. What about Wabagoon's First Nations nursery and silviculture uh, operations? That one, I think, is still going strong. So unless anyone can tell me otherwise, we can give that a higher grade, maybe an A. Uh, the harvesting of fiber uh, on Haida Gwaii, again, fairly good marks, but in a different form. Today, Haida owned 10 forest products, manages 270,000 acres of ancient rainforest harvesting activity and the production and sale of specialty wood products. Um, and it produces timber that reflects the value of the Haida Nation, helps to improve employment opportunities and maintain ancient traditions and the way of life on Haida Gwaii. Uh, the historic shareholder manage, managed sustainable forest license covering the Kenora Forest is also still going fairly well. Uh, the Boreal Forest Agreement, it was discussed, mentioned several times this morning. It suffered with the dropping out of some critical ENGOs, as was raised this morning, uh, particularly those whose business model requires them to market environmental destruction in order to stay in business. Um, I think if your business model is disruptive, it's hard to refocus yourself and remake yourself over into someone that's constructive and, and deliberative and participatory. It's a lasting disappointment to me, however, to have seen them exit because I think the real strength of the Canadian Boreal Agreement is the idea of an intact swath across the country. Uh, still a vision that I hope uh, David is going to achieve before he's allowed to, to ever retire uh, at FPAC. Right, David? He's on it. He's on it. Uh, and Grassy Narrows, which I mentioned earlier, remains entrenched in its losses and its struggles and grievances and its court battles. If you want to know why, I recommend a book called A Poison Stronger Than Love, uh, which talks about their very tragic history. Uh, but if you visit the Grassy Narrows website, as I did uh, earlier this year, you will see that its people are at an interesting stage. They're asking themselves some key questions. Here are some of their questions that are posted. How do we make a living from the earth without destroying it? How do we maintain our culture in a swiftly changing world? How do we continue our way of life where there are activities in our traditional land use area that threaten our Aboriginal and treaty rights? And they say, these questions will not go away. Leaving them unanswered means others will speak in our silence. And yet, neither inside or outside of its circle has Grassy Narrow's First Nation accre achieved a consensus or agreement. There's a lovely analogy or image on its website. I really recommend you have a look at it. The writer says, an agreement without people to make it is like a partridge without wings. It won't fly, and the snow and meat-eating enemies will claim it in time. It's a powerful and insightful picture, that partridge without wings, and a sad one. So if I look back over all those projects in a long career, uh, I'd say it's a pretty mixed report card overall. 
And looking at it even more dispassionately, I'd have to say that the real successes came when the companies stopped helping. I like to say helping. Uh, and you might ask, what then did you really accomplish out of all those encounters, those discussions, those draft and final MOUs, consultation agreements, sweat lodges, and shared meals? The sweat lodge was hard work. Who's done one of those? I discovered I had like a pint of sweat in me. Like it, there, was, there wasn't enough to go around. Uh, those are hard work. Uh, I think these initiatives uh, often took those who participated outside our comfortable circles and into that space between us. They started a dialogue that included some of those large ownerless issues that I mentioned before. They ventured toward and sometimes even directly into authenticity. They forced new questions and new approaches. I'm encouraged, as I've said, by the questions that Grassy Narrows is asking itself, and even more so by the power and art of that partridge analogy. Across Canada, even in BC where everything is a lightning rod, some resource projects are going ahead, slowly and with deliberation, but they are proceeding. As the judge said in one recent BC case, one can always say that a further study could have been prepared, a further meeting could have been held, or a further submission could have been received. That will always be true. I am opposed from any tendency to separate environmental from economic issues. We should strive against the perception that environmental issues are necessarily in conflict with corporate interests. Businesses need to understand that their own financial interests are going to be very much informed by environmental and sustainability issues. And we can't make much progress on the environment without involving the corporate issues and the other economic stakeholders. In the end, it turns out that ethics is not just a subject for the philosophy department. The minute you start to ask questions about the world and doing business in it, you are in fact asking questions about ethics as well. What is the right thing to do and what is the right way to get a task done that will affect the world, often for generations? In an article called Decision Making for Leaders under the Advanced Leadership Initiative at Harvard, there's this. Addressing an unmet social need or unsolved problem differs from assigning tasks or formulating strategies in established organizations or exercising leadership in a domain with existing pathways and institutions. Even seemingly simple ideas for change require multiple strategies in multiple domains taking various stakeholders into context. Advanced leaders, and I think in this room we have a number of advanced leaders, must work within complex and often poorly organized social context where authority is diffused, resources are dispersed, stakeholders are diverse, and goals are vague, ambiguous, or conflicting. Does any of this sound familiar to anybody here? So what is the answer? First, we need to be aware we know less than we think we know. We need to challenge our own assumptions. I remember a First Nation leader saying to me, he said, you assume we want a wage economy here. And I was quite startled. I did assume that. Who doesn't want to get paid? I certainly did, but he did not. Second, kill your darlings. Your thinking is unduly bounded by timelines, goals, budgets, emotions, a need to win or be seen to win, etc. For example, I have more often advanced in the bigger picture by giving a win to someone else than by taking a win for myself, and not only giving a win, but celebrating it. Third, when you can, draw the discussion to the space between, to the bigger picture, to the larger goals and problems and stakes. Often I have found that the real challenges to doing this are within your own organization and not in the other fellows' organizations, so that can take some doing to get the support of the people around you. What does it take to get to answers? You're doing the dialogue, you're having the discussions, you're giving wins, you're celebrating. The Advanced Leadership Institute has some good guidance for us. Find and feed your passion and drive for the project. Know yourself and lever your best skills and your best networks. Keep in mind the doability of the project. Keep in mind the context. For uh, problem parts outside your control, you need to be adaptable, creative, and patient. Patience is not my strong point, however. Resilience is key to this, as it is in much of life. 
This requires flexibility, and I might add, it also requires that you take care of yourself and others on your project, both your, in your circle and the others. And take care, authentic care, for yourself, for the other humans who toil to build something new and wonderful. The big shared value question is whether behaving virtuously makes firms more profitable. Believe me, if it were clear that virtue paid off handsomely, all of corporate doings, indeed all of human history, would have unfolded very differently than it has. I think this, in the end, is the wrong question. I think what we're going to find is that virtue may not generally be capable of being shown to pay off in terms of incremental earnings, but it may be more readily shown to be linked to an on-off switch. Whether the formal, whatever the formal licensing bodies have to say on a subject, good projects will get to go ahead, and bad ones very often won't. I recently participated in Vancouver at an Edelman event. Edelman, event. Edelman is an international PR firm that puts out a trust index, or a trust barometer, every year, and it measures and reports on trust levels in 27 countries, including Canada. The 2015 Edelman Trust Barometer shows a global decline in trust over the past year and that the number of countries with trusted institutions has fallen to an all-time low among the informed public. Imagine what it must be like amongst the uninformed public, I ask myself. So their key takeaways for this year were that trust in business experienced a significant drop among Canadians, falling to 47%, down from 62% last year, and 10 points below the global number. 80% of Canadians agree that a company can take specific acts, actions that both increase profits and improve the economic and social conditions in the community where it operates. Trust in media dropped by 9 points to 47%, the second largest change after business. NGOs remain the most trusted institution in Canada, remaining steady at 67%, which is 18% higher than the next closest institution, government, at 49%. Despite a drop of 13 points, academic and industry experts remain the most trusted spokespersons at 60%. CEOs are the least trusted at 28%, well below the global average of 41. Canadians believe that business growth targets and greed and money are the biggest drivers of change for business. Canadians believe that improves people's lives or make the world a better place are the least likely to drive change for business. They suggest that business needs to undertake three sets of actions. One, solve problems, bring ideas and products to market that yield benefit while ensuring the public sees the connection between the new development and the social benefit. Two, behave, conduct business with a commitment to transparency, listen to feedback, and be willing to modify products and services when necessary. And third, engage, adopt a new framework designed to facilitate discussion and dialogue in order to explain the benefits of your products and communicate ethical practices in bringing them to market. Now, as the Chancellor of Simon Fraser University, we have a framework for all we do, and it is to be an engaged university. I keep expecting UBC to come out with a slogan that says, you, know, you may be engaged, but we're actually married, but so far they haven't done that. So I always put engagement first. Engagement inside our organizations. Engagement with the other participants in a problem. Engagement with the unknowns that lie in the space between. I started by saying this. The far greater challenge is the inability of organizations to resolve problems when the solution requires engaging with other parties who see the world differently. Here's the flip side of that. Success lies when we engage with other parties who see the world differently, and it leads to the right products, the right services, the right purpose, and the right operations. We cannot afford to get it wrong. Thank you. Um, Anne, that was a tour de force. Bravo to you. Thank you for provoking us, um, for challenging us. 
And among many takeaways uh, that I uh, will take from your remarks is the, uh, the definitely strong bias I now have for reading science fiction and encouraging others to do so as well. That was, uh, that was really wonderful. Um, Anne has agreed to, uh, to respond to comments or questions. We have a few minutes for that. Can we go to this mic right over here? Great. Uh, my name is Rhonda Moore. I'm with the Association of Universities and Colleges of Canada. Okay. Uh, I want to go back to some of your earliest comments about the circles with the fruit in them. And uh, I liked that you used some food analogies because that's how I think as well. Um, and when you drew that bigger circle, I expected you to say that people wouldn't just see cherries and apples and oranges, that they would see fruit, but you said pizza. And I thought, okay, well, that maybe reinforces how we all come at at a challenge or an opportunity with a very different frame. And so I thought going from Weyerhaeuser to Simon Fraser uh, changes your frame considerably. And could you comment on, in your new role, how do you see Simon Fraser addressing that area of authenticity that you referenced uh, in the context of those bigger questions that encircle the forest sector? That's a great question. Thank you for it. Um, a, a couple of ways, uh, uh, and more than a couple. One is, um, boy, there's tons of smart people at universities. And, you know, the professors, of course, but those young people, oh my heavens. Um, they are so informed and uh, eager and uncomplaining and uh, ready to tackle the world. So that's one thing I see that, uh, you know, the forest sector got older and older during my, my time with it because there was a period where we weren't really hiring people. So it's engaging, fabulously engaging to be around young people. Secondly, Simon Fraser has uh, a world-renowned center for dialogue the WASC Center for Dialogue in downtown Vancouver. And uh, it is a fabulous space. And it is also a place where uh, diverse interests get together and in a kind of a, a round setting that pe forces people to look together, um, engage in hard questions, hard dialogue, hard discussions. Uh, and I think third, uh, universities, um, they don't have something, they don't have a, a toe in the, the water in some ways. They don't have a, um, a stake. Uh, they have an ability to take that higher view that we heard of uh, from Professor Kishore earlier, um, the bigger picture, uh, the, the, the broader and longer term time frame, um, and the luxury of doing the kind of thinking that uh, I think as companies and organizations we need to, to tap into. Uh, it's been, uh, I, it, 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 there's nothing more humbling, frankly, than going onto a, uh, a campus uh, and uh, realizing that whether you're with uh, undergraduates, graduate students, uh, professors, or frankly, the people in plant and planning, I'm always the dumbest person in the room. But that's a great place to be because all you can do is learn. So that's, that's a great question. And I think the dialogue, that connection, that, that um, determination to see dialogue occur is, is probably critical. Thank you. Another question here? Comment? Hi, my name is Lane and I'm with the Public Policy Forum. And I wanted to touch on, uh, you mentioned how shared value uh, maybe needs to be redefined away from profitability and how we may be able to use other metrics. And I think that's a very interesting comment considering some of our discussions earlier today were also very reflecting on what is the value of data? Uh, how do we collect that data? How do we communicate that data? I was curious to know, uh, in your experience as president and CEO, how did you define, uh, if you were moving away from you know, your traditional metrics of profitability in a for-profit company, how would you capture those uh, parts of shared value that are qualitative and not as easily quantifiable? Well, first of all, I hired a really good CFO and said, you do all those number of things that make sure that we have the right to carry on business, make sure we show a profit every year, don't care how you do it, but make sure we're making a profit. And uh, that's, I'm somewhat joking because I've worked closely with him, but uh, we, I mean, make sure, that you don't forget the numbers, they have to be there or you lose your right to carry on business. So that's an on-off switch. Um, so, but then having done that, and I give kudos to Weyerhaeuser actually, uh, they uh, encouraged me and I uh, was able to work with others like thinking people in the company to measure and quantify as best we could uh, many of those intangibles. And more, that's more of this is happening. We know, for example, that uh, the 
companies are doing sustainability reports, for example, or belonging to different indices, uh, FTSE for good, um, Dow Jones, whatever it is, uh, corporate nights, uh, that do endeavor to measure these things. And, and I think what we find is that it's not an, an, an a world of absolute measures. You're not going to top out. Um, but it's a comparative, it's a world of comparative measures. So you can establish baselines, um, much as FPAC has done with uh, its forestry and economic uh, footprint uh, and environmental footprint, and um, establish a baseline, compare yourself to others, see where the needle's going. You can certainly see when it's slipping or sliding, uh, and you have to start somewhere. And so, uh, and also I have found uh, comparative measurements of less coate uh, measures uh, are inspiring to people. So uh, a group in Warehouser that was doing, I don't know, uh, First Nations engagement, wanted to do better than the guys at West Fraser. It was just, it's human nature. And um, you ha but assigning a number and a value to it allows that um, competitive, that good competition to occur. Whereas if you just have words, um, that doesn't occur. So it's uh, engaging and, and it creates a, a tangible, measurable challenge for people. So um, that's, that's my approach. But have a CFO to keep track of the dollars. That's first. Um, thank you. That was just a wonderful uh, a lecture. And I would hope that that will be a, will be a transcript of it so that my children can read oh, what you. you just spoke. But I think it was really powerful. Um, so my question actually is about the themes that came out of your uh, really hopeful uh, presentation about how to actually think about engaging, showing empathy, and finding collective solutions. Um, and a question we're wrestling with in my own lab is um, different kinds of problems that we face. So on the land use side, even practices side, I think what you're saying really works well, and we can find some really important collective solutions. But there are some other problems facing the planet that actually don't have the same kind of ability to um, render all the different values at the same, in the same way. There's a hierarchy of values, and that one probably most predominantly is climate change. So the climate science is saying to us, you really can't get above two degrees Celsius without risking significant catastrophic impacts. Might be three degrees, might be 3.5, but two degrees is pretty safe. And so the problem we're finding in our lab is that the more you have compromised empathetic solutions, the more you accidentally find solutions that get above two degrees. So how do you address those ones in which there's a really difficulty in the hierarchy of values facing um, Addressing them is, is the hard question. Measuring them, I think, is easier. And uh, I think, uh, and you can only measure where you've set goals. So, for example, Canada has goals set for uh, all kinds of environmental values that get audited. There's an auditor uh, office that actually goes around and audits whether Canada meets its environmental goals. And my view is that that audit is limited and bounded, as I use that word, and needs to include auditing questions like the extent to which we're really wrestling with climate change, whether it's ameliorative, which is not a lot of that's happening, except by accident, uh, or uh, adaptive. And so I think if the discussion were to turn more to adaption uh, and, and uh, adaptation, sorry, and auditing it, measuring it, um, putting, putting values on it, although it's the wrong end of the discussion because adaptation is not ameliorative, I think it starts that dialogue in a non-threatening way so that you can then talk about ameliorative strategies. I think we tend to start at uh, the, the cure. And um, I often think back to when I took my first contracts class in, in um, law school. Interestingly enough, it was a great approach. They taught remedies first. Uh, what do you do when a contract's been broken? And uh, it seemed odd to learn about contractual remedies before we even knew what a contract was. But I think uh, it led to a much more fruitful discussion because when we started to talk about the contracts, we already knew how to fix them. So I think that that's where the, that's where the fertile, for me, the fertile discussion is in that area. And that then leads backwards to, to the problem set. Does that help? Yeah. Please, Andre. Uh, Andre Morisot, the Canadian Council for Aboriginal Business. I Andre. just want to say that I really, really enjoyed uh, your speaking here today. 
And it's obvious why there were so many great accolades paid to you, why you are one of the top 100 most powerful women in... Leaving aside my daughter, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I really thought that uh, your statement about Obama saying, you know, bad choices flowing from decisions made one or two years ago. Uh, you know, there seems to be a lot of talk out there about leadership that refuses to ever acknowledge making any mistakes and the damage that that does in the yeah. world of reality. Especially in First Nations. Well, area. yes, yes, yeah. yes, yes. Well, I hope you're not talking about one in particular. No, just kidding. <laughs> Mine. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Sorry. Um, to my chief. <laughs> my question to you is, has there been any decisions that you have made that or a decision that you have made that you knew was wrong in well, your style of leadership, where you grasped the bull by the horns and said, that was wrong, and addressed it from such a point of view? Well, I think certainly First Nations is, is the obvious, is the obvious uh, area. Um, I, we've been considerably better as an industry, forestry, for, I'd say over the last however many years. Um, but uh, the legacy is not a great one. And uh, talking about uh, Haida Gwaii, um, the barges of logs left uh, for many, many, many years under the noses of the local residents without much in the way of value accruing to them. Uh, they got a bowling alley one year, uh, and that was during a year when I think Mill Bloodell uh, made $50 million off just logs from Haida Gwaii. So, um, does that seem like a fair trade to you? Just, just saying. So, um, but one of the big things, big picture, big solutions, and it came from Weyerhaeuser, not from me, but I thought it was brilliant, was uh, in, uh, let me think, around the very early 2000s, was to give back 20% of tenure. So the forest companies had, over many years, locked up all the tenure. There was no room for new participants for communities or for First Nations. And so the big idea came from Weyerhaeuser to say, we give back 50, 20%, it should have been higher, but it was 20% at the time, which was you know, needle changing, of tenure back to government. And that was available for distribution to First Nations and communities and others. And um, it got traction and it actually occurred. So. Um, you know, great idea and, and, a, and a way of uh, atonement, maybe, uh, starting to set the, the course right. Um, so that was probably, and it was exciting to be involved in. Um, recognizing uh, another area was, uh, Weyerhaeuser was the uh, party that took the Haida case up to the Supreme Court of Canada. And the Haida case was whether or not First Nations had a veto. That was the big question. There was other questions too, but from the point of view of business, it was whether First Nations had a veto. And um, it was um, a tough case. Um, and uh, I was proud that throughout that entire case, going all the way to the Supreme Court of Canada, and in the Supreme Court of Canada, I sat next to Gucho. And we kept, we remained friends, we remained business partners, we remained in dialogue and in discussion. Uh, we disagreed vehemently on the question that went to the Supreme Court of Canada but we found a way to stay uh, on an even keel uh, and let the systems that existed find, help us find solutions when we were unable to reach them. So um, if you want all the mistakes I made, I can, we can have a just quiet discussion. <laughs> they might claw back my pension if I, to if I told you all of them. Hi, Anne. Andrew Hi. DeVries with the Sustainable Forestry Initiative. Hi, Andrew. I know each other, but I thought I'd introduce myself for you guys. Um, Often when we talk in these, these situations, we, we point the finger at business and we say, oh, business is making profits and, you know, is that a good thing or a bad thing? And, and then I sit back and I reflect as a Canadian, I'm an investor, I have mutual funds, I have a pension plan which is invested in many Canadian businesses and overseas. So as an investor, I have a very personal interest in these businesses and, and their ultimate performance for my retirement and my children's education. Um, and then I'm also a consumer, as we all are in this room. And yet, so you would think the system would work perfectly. As an investor, I want these companies to perform. And as a consumer, I want goods that are eco-friendly and cheap and affordable and all these other things. So why do we have this finger pointing at business when yet we are all, A, part of the investment into that business ultimately, and we're also consuming the goods from those businesses? 
Yeah, that's the pogo conundrum, right? We have met the enemy and it is us. Is that how it goes? Uh, I, uh, you know, it doesn't matter how big your company is or how engaging, you end up listening to yourselves and believing yourself. And part of being successful, I think, means believing yourself. And my view is that business feels like it's been wrenched, especially in this sector, through a lot, a lot of change. Um, and that's only just started, that we're just starting that path. The change ahead is, will dwarf the change we've seen during the uh, 21 years of my career in the sector. Um, and that change will involve becoming more authentically aligned, allied with contractors, with shareholders, with consumers. Um, and uh, some of it will make economic sense and some of it won't. Um, we don't run our lives purely as economic creatures, much as econ economists would like to believe that. We have other, a number of other values. And so uh, that dialogue and the pain of change will be ongoing. Um, I don't know about the pace, I can't predict that, but um, that will lead to, I, I, read a I read a study recently, some of you may know this, about uh, the, the, the involvement of Chine Chinese consumers in brands. And Chinese consumers, by and large, grossly generalizing, but more than many areas of the world, feel that they are in relationship with a brand. So they're more likely to buy a branded product and feel that that's a two-way, discursive, involved, engaged relationship. And I think we have a ton to learn about that. And not because we want to just create a brand, but because creating an ongoing two-way pathway where the consumer feels engaged and in a dialogue with the, with the brand, I think is a, is a vigorous concept. And I don't know that we've figured yet really how to do that. Um, but there's certainly an example before us that we can learn from. I don't even know if that begins to approach your question, but that's my answer. And I'm sticking to it. Great. Ladies and gentlemen. Andrea Ardini, Chancellor, business leader, lawyer, community activist, author, novelist, source of inspiration to us all. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. That was really terrific. Um, ladies and gentlemen, this has been a really uh, terrific way to cap a uh, dialogue on an important issue. The conversation can't end here, it must continue, but our session is going to be drawing to a close now. Um, the Public Policy Forum has been very, very pleased to partner with the partners listed right up here on the slide, the Forest Products Association of Canada, Natural Resources Canada. And uh, I've asked uh, David Lindsay if he would uh, uh, please make some concluding summary remarks based on this dialogue. Please welcome to the stage, David Lindsay. Well, it's been uh, just a terrific day. And uh, thanks everybody in the room and anybody who's still uh, on the internet uh, for hanging with us uh, all day today. We, promised we'd be done by two o'clock, and I think we've been very efficient and very effective throughout the day. But uh, more than uh, just being well organized, uh, thanks to uh, our good friends at the Public Policy Forum and David and your team, it's been uh, rich with content. Um, David asked me to make a, a few concluding comments, so I had to madly scramble through my notes, and, uh, and I'm not a trained journalist like uh, Buck or Ann at the back of the room here, so you'll see whether I've actually been paying attention or not today. Uh, I too want to extend particular thanks to, to Ann. Thank you for uh, capping uh, such a wonderful day today. We've had a couple of great panel sessions this morning as well, so uh, let's just walk quickly through what some of those uh, key messages were and, and thank the participants uh, who helped make a, a rich dialogue this afternoon and this morning. Uh, we started out by talking about data and the analysis of data. Uh, the importance of understanding the, the layers of data and uh, their proper interpretation and their interrelationship. We discussed the need for uh, respect and trust and common understanding. Uh, Pierre did a couple of interesting things. He uh, uh, not only explained to me the layers of data from, from analyzing the soil right up to the, to the satellite technology, um, but he also talked about incremental metrics as opposed to zero, one, uh, on, off. Uh, a concept I hadn't given much thought to, but I think that, that enriches the conversation. And uh, he concluded by saying uh, uh, 
not to let others defend, uh, define us, but we should define ourselves. Uh, Winnet uh, was terrific in, in her uh, participation as well, uh, challenging us to make sure that the data is out there and it's available. Uh, we got into a conversation about uh, big data and, and reaching out and sharing information. And of course, uh, Andre uh, encouraged us all to, to think about the, the Aboriginal partnerships and the, and the need to engage. Uh, so Progressive Aboriginal Relations, PAR, is, uh, is a tool that uh, he encouraged all of us to use. The second panel, uh, chaired by, by Glenn Mason, was uh, a, a really interesting discussion that uh, uh, went from, from global to, to local and back again a number of times. So my notes are a little bit more uh, disjointed uh, on that one, but I found it a fascinating discussion. Uh, ben first challenged us all to think about it as a seminar and uh, to remember him as the California effect, uh, which I thought was quite uh, novel and uh, again, a concept I hadn't given much thought to, so thanks to, to Ben for that. And, and, and uh, uh, Janet from UBC, thank you for being here today, uh, coming out and joining us, and, and Aaron, uh, for your participation. We, we got into some interesting discussions about the certification process and, and uh, uh, the international comparison and local implementation. And uh, Aaron told us about the CBA, CBFA and, and the successes and the challenges of, of that collaborative relationship. Uh, it was a, a great discussion broke out uh, on, in terms of the difference between international standards and the use of of different certifications and, and how it gets limp, implemented uh, on the ground. And I, I wrote down a quote from, from uh, uh, Janet who said, it, it always comes back to boots on the ground implementation. So you can have all the theoretical discussions you want, but it, it does come back to, to what happens on the ground. And my favorite uh, quote, well, maybe it's a paraphrase. My favorite paraphrase from Aaron is, uh, collaboration is harder than it looks, something like that. Uh, it, it's a challenge, but it's a worthwhile challenge, so thank you to that panel. Uh, we, we raised a great diversity of issues and, and uh, had some good examples of, of successes and, and pathways forward. I want to thank uh, not only the participants uh, on the panels, but uh, those who asked questions both uh, from the web and, and here in the audience. Uh, we had a, a good exchange of views and that uh, go back to the, the round table symbol of the Public Policy Forum is what it's all about bringing a diversity of opinions to the table. Uh, it's not uh, my prerogative nor my responsibility to conclude uh, an entire uh, uh, five hours of discussion in, in a couple of sentences, but uh, uh, hubris is uh, maybe one of my weaknesses. Um, I, the conclusion I came to was that we are so typically Canadian. On the one hand, we're challenging ourselves to continue to be uh, improving on the social, economic, and the environmental metrics. Uh, we're challenging ourselves to be open and accountable. But, as I say, we're typically Canadian. We're not boastful about the amazing journey we've been on and the amazing progress we've made. Our journey relative to virtually any other forestry jurisdiction in the world is pretty incredible. Our sustainability standards and the uh, continuous improvement and the challenges we've set for ourselves are trying to be understood and replicated by others. Imitation is the best form of flattery. So while we've learned a lot and there's still much more to learn, we should celebrate our successes. Anne's message was quite profound. She encouraged us to think about the spaces between the circles. We've come a long way in understanding the individual circles of social, economic, and environmental responsibility. Now we're embarking on a journey to think about those spaces between the circles. Today's dialogue has contributed to that journey. We've come a long way and there's more to be done. And I want to thank you and the Public Policy Forum for giving us impetus to keep going. Thanks very much. Well, David, you just help us write our report. <laughs> uh, that was, uh, was really very well done in terms of synthesizing a very, very rich dialogue that we've all shared today. So thank you, David. It's always a pleasure personally to work with you, and we've really enjoyed working with members of your team. 
uh, that's been a, a real collaboration to use that somewhat controversial word. I say controversial not because we don't subscribe to it. In fact, that's what the Public Policy Forum is all about. We really believe in collaboration. But it is so true that it's not as easy as it sounds. It is harder than it looks. And in the spirit of going forward and advancing that you've outlined, David, let me just say this. We need to recommit to not use collaboration as an excuse for inaction. Ladies and gentlemen, I thank you all for your involvement today. Ben Kishore asked Anne if uh, he could have a copy of her speech so that he could sh share it with his uh, son. Did you say? Uh, I've got, I've got uh, something that might satisfy Ben and everybody else in the room. Each of you uh, will receive in the days ahead not only a summary report of this day that we've shared together, but on the website of the Public Policy Forum, you'll be able to refer people to the entire program, which has been videotaped. So all of the panel discussions and, indeed, Angie Ardini's uh, luncheon address will be available and accessible to all who uh, might benefit from viewing it. I'll be viewing it again, I can tell you that. Uh, with that, I wish you all the best uh, for a good weekend ahead, TGIF. <laughs> Alla prochaine.